Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to this face-to-face -face meeting of the Council. This is the first um, first meeting for first face first face-to-face meeting for uh, 16 months uh, here in the new Council chamber. Uh, given the government's recommendations to exercise caution together with our own health and safety device, it has been necessary to limit the number of councillors, officers and members of the public in attendance in the chamber to ensure the meeting can take place safely. Thank you to everyone for your support and cooperation in this. Uh, we're streaming today's meeting live on the internet and a recorded version will be available to view within 48 hours on the North Somerset Council website. To avoid the need for councillors to sign an attendance register for today's meeting and for the benefit of those watching via YouTube, the solicitor will now undertake a roll call of all councillors to confirm attendance. Um, I will then move on to the formal agenda. So uh, over to you, Nick. Chairman, thank you. As members will anticipate, um, I have got a fair number of apologies in advance, so I will go through those as well whilst I do the roll call. Um, I have to say that the vast majority of those are unfortunately due to COVID reasons, either people um, with illness themselves or people they know or who have been pinged, I think is the latest verb, to ping. Um, and uh, so we've got a fair few of those. So starting with those, um, Councillor Applin has given me apologies, as has Councillor Ashton. Councillor Bell? Present. Councillor Bird has given me apologies. Councillor Bridger? Present. Councillors Bryant and Butte have both given me apologies. Councillor Caniford? Present. Councillor Cartman? Present. The following councillors have all given apologies. Councillor Cato, Councillor Charles, Councillor Cherry, Councillor Clayton, and Councillor Codling. Councillor Cole. Present. Councillor Crewe has given me apologies. Councillor Crockford Hawley. Present. Councillor Cronley. Present. Councillor Crosby has given me apologies. Councillor Davies. Uh, Councillor Davies is on his way. He's just delayed in traffic. I heard there has been some incident. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Gibbons. Present. Councillor Goddard. Councillor Gregor, thank you. Councillor Goddard is not present, I don't believe yet. Again, she's coming from the north of Dissich, so may well be in the same traffic problems as uh, Councillor Davies. Councillor Haverson has given me apologies. Councillor Hearn. Present. Following apo apologies from the following councillors Hitchens, Hogg, Holland, and Jacobs. Councillor James. Present. Councillor Keating has given me apologies. Councillor Leigh Morgan. Now, I haven't seen Councillor Leigh Morgan. Councillor McQuillan. Present. Councillor Parker has given apologies. Councillor Payne. Present. Councillor Pepperell. Present. Apologies from the following. Councillors Petty, Pilgrim, Porter and Richardson. Councillor Shopland. Don't think I've seen Councillor Shopland. No. Councillor Snaden. Councillor Solomon has given apologies. Councillor Tonkin. Present. Councillor Tucker. Present. And Councillor Westwood. Present. And I have apologies from Councillor Willis. And obviously we have one vacancy, hopefully to be filled later this week. Thank you. Um, I was going to welcome uh, Caroline Kaz Goddard. Uh, as our new councillor, but uh, as she's not here, that I'll have to wait until she gets here. Um, I would just say uh, that um, I would ask that councillors and members of the public remain seated when they are speaking, please. We'll move forward then to uh, item one on the agenda, addresses by members of the public. Um, I understand we have uh, Mr. Richard Sibley with us uh, from Claverham. 
uh, who wishes to address the Council on affordable homes ownership for all with big social benefits. Mr Sibley. Thank you, councillors, and thank you, Chairman. In a, in a, regarding the Council's course strategy and climate emergency strategy plan, after discussions with Councillor Bridget Petty about what homes would need to be like in an effort to create a carbon-free economy, I have produced a six-page paper of suggestions for you all to consider. This paper I circulated to Councillor Petty, Councillor Davis and Councillor Tonkin. It's called Affordable Homes Ownership for All with Big Social Benefits. Basically, it argues that in a more constrained financial time like now, those people unable to av avoid renting a home in the future will obviously be left way behind people who can afford to buy a home as they get even more expensive because of green tariffs, equipment and electric vehicles, etc. You may say, it's always been so. Poorer people have always struggled, and I couldn't disagree. But as a council, as a council entirely, it's your role, as I understand it, to balance environmental needs with social, economic, and welfare needs. And this applies to the residents throughout the district. Of, co of course, changes in your approach to the types of homes needed to square the circle, that's what I call it, has to be considered within your local remit from the government. Government is separate. So what I'm rec recommending is to promote all legal ways to allow accommodation to be used where transport to work, education and amenities along bus routes, in particular in people's gardens and on farmland, uh, could be used and promoted. Currently, there's there's quite a lot of easement on the use of garden space for accommodation. It doesn't include washing or cooking. That's got to be done in the main dwelling. But there's a, I'm sure lots of youngsters in particular would easily be able to manage meals out, washing out, and just come home to sleep after a long day's work. But what I'm proposing is that they could save the money they would normally have to spend for bricks and mortar rental. Um, naturally, promoting all legal ways would be in your remit, as I say. Who, who would not like alternatives for our children? It's all of our children. And if it's not our children, it's our nieces and nephews. Who would not want them to save paying rent so that they could afford capital to buy a home of their own? Which I say is the linchpin to democracy. The home share scheme... Uh, which you're proposing to set up, I've looked into it, it could answer a few people's problems, and particularly the old people that are living on their own. But it's not fundamentally going to solve the problem of the reason why people, youngsters that need a deposit need to save money. They've still got to lay money out. Even the homeowner has to pay money out to be involved in the scheme. So to, to my way of thinking, it's not the answer entirely. <clears throat> Naturally, as a council, you'd need to work very closely with the planning department to ensure that um, people did follow guidelines, and, but with a proactive approach and a council proactive approach, I'm sure we could start to turn, turn this district into certainly a bigger percentage of home ownership, a lot more happiness, a lot more fulfilment, and with that comes good workers. If you've got good, happy workers and they can live sustainably in their own home, it gives them a drive, they work harder, they're, they're much more efficient. Naturally, I'm only asking you to do this, but my invi I invite to you is to pr please study the proposals, it's only six pages. The last page gives you an analysis opportunity where you can actually put down what savings the council could make and it would show you how to use the cash possibly saved and the extra council tax that would come eventually, um, reductions in the ben housing benefit. I know the government used to control housing benefit, but as far as I'm aware, things are changing and it, a lot of it's going over to you. Um, 
Mr. If I've got any more time left, any questions? <laughs> I'm quite happy to speak if you, if you want to ask questions. Um, it's not usual, Mr. Sibley. Uh, thank if you it's not very... usual, don't worry. I don't want to break the etiquette. Thank you very much for your contribution. We will uh, look carefully at it, or the council will look carefully at it, and you will be uh, referred to the appropriate executive member and uh, the director. Thank you very director much indeed. Director of place, I suspect, in this instance, but then again, I'm not entirely sure. So thank you again, Mr. Sibley. Chairman, there are two other public speakers who, because of COVID, have op opted um, not to attend in person, but both have asked that their statements be read out. So with your permission, I, I will read those statements on behalf of the other two public participants. Yeah. The, the first one is for um, uh, Thornton Darrell Hurst from Churchill. Thank you, Chairman. So we, the, the statement has been uh, uh, regarding the reopening of Churchill Sports Centre. I am presenting on behalf of the Churchill Sports Centre Working Group, known as Mendip Villages Fitness, and more widely on behalf of the communities in the Mendip Vale. I am also presenting this written statement as a local resident and parent of two young daughters for whom I can't get any swimming lessons so they can't swim, a common theme across all local schools. Our aim is simple, to secure the long-term future for Churchill Sports Centre. This initiative has wide support, including our local MP, three local district councillors, five parish councils, and most importantly, the support of 1,900 members of the Mendip Villages community who responded to a survey we recently conducted. Given there is a critical shortage of sports and leisure facilities, particularly swimming pools, North Somerset Council's policy framework, which calls for innovative, ambitious approaches to secure sports and leisure facilities to reduce health and social costs, the existence and buy-in of local profitable sports facility operators working in partnership with schools and communities, the huge increase in local housing with corresponding funds flowing to the council, the undeniable need to teach our children to swim, the criticality of sporting centres to help the nation emerge from COVID-19, and the ultimate value for money arranged argument in addressing health inequality. There is clear evidence, there is a clear evidenced case to reopen Churchill Sports Centre as a priority. Accordingly, on behalf of the Mendip Villages community, we respectfully request North Somerset Council commit to take the actions and deliver the funding needed to reopen Churchill Sports Centre and secure its long-term future. We understand you and your senior colleagues will be discussing the future of the Sports Centre in the coming weeks and urge you to look favourably on, on ensuring that funding and resource are allocated to secure the future of this important community service. Detailed arguments. The key arguments in favour of funding the reopening of Churchill Sports Centre follows. Nearly 1,900 residents responded to a survey conducted early in 2021. The response overwhelmingly demonstrated support, 98.29% for a Churchill Sports Centre, with 97.23% saying that the poor in particular must be kept open. Over 89% said they would be likely to, likely or likely to, very likely or likely to use the centre if it reopens, clearly making the business case for the centre. North Somerset's strategic aims relating to health and well-being align entirely with the need to increase, not decrease, the provision of sports and leisure facilities. The sports and leisure facilities st strategy states, access to quality sports and leisure facilities is vital to ensuring that North Somerset residents enjoy the benefits of participation which improve health and well-being, both physical and mental, as well as fostering a sense of community. Three, there is an acute shortage of public swimming pools in North Somerset, we have been contacted by numerous organisations and individuals who are desperate for swimming lessons. One swimming lesson provider has hundreds of children on their waiting list. North Somerset is a coastal county and Churchill Village alone has three new attenuation ponds required to offset the local flood risk. Elderly residents say that swimming provides vital exercise to address chronic health conditions and they are unable to access any pool time locally. For the huge increase in housing, across all villages in the Mendip Vale has resulted in significantly increased demand for leisure and health facilities. These cannot be accommodated by the remaining facilities in North Somerset. Significant Section 106 seal monies have accumulated and could be used. Five, our strong belief is that Churchill Sports Centre can be run profit profitably. 
Our investigations suggest that the model operated by King's Leisure Limited in Cheddar, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Wessex Learning Trust, demonstrates that there are partnership between a leisure operator, a school and the community with the commitment and support of the local authority can be very successful. Six, our campaign to reopen Churchill Sports Centre has the support of MPs, parish councils and district councillors within the catchment. John Penrose MP has expressed support, saying that investment in Churchill Sports Centre addresses many of the critical government concerns regarding ch childhood obesity, pressures on the NHS and the post-COVID need for mental health and wellbeing provision. In summary, we urge you to take a holistic and long-term view of the return on investment for the community. The benefits of greater sports provision, a reduction in health inequality and social isolation, not simply the short-term financial challenges. Finally, we much appreciate the Council giving us the opportunity to have our voice heard. Well, I'd just like to thank uh, Mr Hurst for the, for the statements which was provided uh, in advance and has been published and which you've all just, just heard. Uh, and this matter will be referred uh, to the relevant executive member and director. Again, in my view, this would be place, I presume. Right. So across now to uh, Mr. Alan Rice, uh, again speaking on um, affordable housing. Thank you, Chairman. So Mr. Rice's statement is as follows. Thank you, Chairman and Councillors, for giving me the opportunity to present this statement to you this afternoon. Firstly, I must congratulate Councillor Bridger and other members of the Executive on the decision to explore purchasing the Homes England land in Western Town Centre and bringing the land back into use for quality and affordable housing. This is the most welcome change of direction from the Western Supermare Town Centre Regeneration Supplementary Planning Document adopted February 2017, which does not require developers to provide housing, affordable housing. Affordable housing means different things to different people and appears to depend on your ideology. Whether you believe the market decides what you can afford or whether you believe your income decides what you can afford. The government suggests 80% of market value is an affordable rent. The median rent for a one-bedroom flat in Western Super Air is £608 per calendar month, which makes in the government size a rent of £486.40 affordable. According to Zoopla, there are presently 18 one-bed flats available for rent, of which only six are below £500. But I agree that most, with most housing charities that affordable rent should not be more than 30% of take-home income. The lowest one-bed rent I know at the moment is £475, which on the 30% calculation requires a take-home pay of £19,000 per annum. The average wage for a teaching assistant in Weston is £17,370, and that's before tax. Western private rents are not affordable. And if you're in receipt of housing benefit, the maximum amount is £109.32 per week for a one-bed flat, which doesn't even reach the government affordable level of £486.40 per month. Every tenant I meet on housing benefit has to come up with some top-up amount. The amount of housing benefit payable is known as the Local Housing Allowance, LHA, which, has raised, which was raised on March 31st last year to its current level, but the government's intention is to freeze LHA rates again, although private rents are free to rise. I believe North Somerset Council should argue that LHH rates are raised to more fairly reflect actual rents and automatically increase as rents rise. Back to that Home England land, I urge North Somerset Council to explore new avenues in ensuring truly affordable housing. One idea being discussed in Ireland is the state, or in our case North Somerset Council, retains ownership of the land, builds the homes and markets them at just the cost of construction. With Persimmon reporting an underlying new housing margin for 2020 of 27.6%, the not-for-profit scheme, especially with no land cost to the buyer, should well be on the way to provide affordable homes for purchase in the centre of Weston. And of course, at least 30%, if not more, to be made affordable for social rent, preferably council-owned so the rent does not fall into private hands. I am more than happy to share details of this and other schemes with Councillor Bridger. Our housing market is broken. Let's take positive steps to mend it. Alan Rice, Western Housing Action. Again, I'd uh, very much like to thank uh, Mr Rice or his written statement, which was published in advance and which you've just heard. Um, again, we will refer this to the relevant executive member and director, which again, I suspect is that of place. And now we will move on to item two, apologies for absence. Chairman, those can be taken from the roll call that we did earlier. Thank you. 
and item three, which is petitions, and I believe we have one from uh, Councillor Crewe. Chairman, we do. Uh, so Councillor Crewe has submitted a petition and uh, in introducing it would have said the following words. This petition is from all residents at Thorn Close. They are plagued with pigeon infestation under the solar panels fitted by Alliance Homes. Dead pigeons in the roof gutters and under the panels. Young chicks flying down onto gardens, forcing residents to keep pets indoors. Our housing and pest control teams have been involved and an officer has made contact with residents, suggesting they speak to Alliance, which is full circle. The panel installers have a solution and are awaiting Alliance to give an order. Please, members, can we find a way to forward this? Um, thank you. And the petition itself reads, to whom it may concern, the residents of Thorn Close Whirl are petitioning North Somerset Council to bring pressure to bear on relevant authorities to fully deal with the infestation of feral pigeons under the solar, pa solar panels fitted to many of the properties in the street. These birds are causing misery to all of us, presenting both a health hazard and, national nuisance, uh, and, and noise nuisance. And uh, then obviously I've got the, the names of the petitioners. Thank you, Chairman. Well, um, that's very interesting. So we'll move on now to item four, declarations of any disclosable pecuniary interest. Are there any? I see none, Chairman, thank you. No. Good. On then to uh, item five, the minutes from our previous meeting on the 20th of April 2021, which have been published. So I will ask the leader and welcome Councillor Davis. My apologies for lateness, um, Mr. Chairman, to see the first view of you uh, in, in, in the flesh, as it were. Um, I move them, yes. We move them, and we need a, we need a seconder. So we've got... Councillor Tonkin, Chairman, thank you. Happy to second Tonkin. that, Chairman. And we need to move to a vote. So all those in favour of approval of the minutes. That's carried. Thank you, Chairman. I have received one comment on, on the minutes from Councillor Ashton, who is unable to be here today, but has asked me to pass on that during the lockdown, questions have not always been answered. I put a question to the April meeting, and three months later have still not received the written answer, as promised in the minutes. Chairman, with your permission, I will take that away and, uh, and chase up a response for Councillor Ashton. Yes, I think that would be very appropriate, uh, Nick. So we move on then to uh, item six, motions uh, from members. Um, the first motion, to review and strengthen the Council's low carbon advertising policies, which has been published with the agenda. So. Uh, I can see that we've got uh, Councillor McQuillan to introduce. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yep, I will be bringing this motion, which is drafted by Councillor Petty in consultation with Councillor Connolly, uh, as Councillor Petty is one of the thousands of people who have been pinged uh, by the NHS app. Um, and I'll, I'll briefly introduce the motion now. That's acceptable to the Council. Do I need to look for a number of supporters first? Thank you. With your discretion, Chairman, I'll proceed. Oh, absolutely. I think we've got more than enough there. Thank you. So, firstly, on a, on a personal note, uh, although obviously it's unfortunate that Councillor Petty can't be here, it's particularly pleasing that I'm able to bring this motion as it's a subject that residents have written to me on on several occasions, asking that we look at this area. So, the, the motion before you is to strengthen our low carbon advertising policies. There is no doubt that we need to cut carbon in every different way that we can. Anyone that's watched the news over the weekend will be aware of the severity of the effects of climate change currently, and we need to be looking at every policy lever we have. Um, so this motion is something that's been brought in other parts of the council, sorry, other councils in the country as well. It seeks to build on the precedent around the tobacco industry and other industries where there is a clear scientific proof of harm from particular products it doesn't seek to ban those products. It doesn't take away anyone's freedom of choice. It merely seeks to restrict and monitor the advertising. And we all know how powerful advertising can be. 
So first you know, point to make, and it's in the papers in front of you, this would not seek to ban any particular product. It's simply to investigate how we can, in the context of a climate emergency, modify our existing advertising policy such that we don't overly stimulate demand for certain carbon-intensive products. It has been drafted in consultation with the relevant officers. I don't think I'm going to go, I'm happy to take questions, but I don't really want to go through the, the motion word by words. I'm sure everyone wants to, to proceed with the agenda, so I'll, I'll stop there. That's okay and look for a second there, but I'm happy to take any queries going through. Councillor Cronley. Uh, yeah, well then, I'm happy to, to second. I just want to give some context to this, really, of how it came out from my perspective of uh, a resident got in touch and went, I've heard you've declared a climate emergency. I think you're missing a trick here with this. Councillor Payne and I looked into it, we're missing a trick with it, so that's how this motion uh, came about. So this is, isn't two politicians in a room, this has actually come about through residents. So I just wanted to add that context, really. Is anybody else uh, wanting to speak? Right, first, well, oh, sorry, I thought we'd um, find seven. Sorry. We need seven members to keep their hands firmly up if they wish a debate on this. That's more than, more than enough, I think. We'll move to a, a debate, hopefully not too long. So, Councillor Bell. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I am happy to, to support this motion. Um, I just wanted to sort of make a plea, really, as it's taken away by the um, director and exec member, as, as has been requested in the terms of the motion, that we, as quickly as possible, really tightly define what we mean by a low-carbon policy, because I think my only nervousness about this motion and its wording is that it isn't terribly clear exactly what we mean, uh, and I think we just need to put some definition on that, because I think um, it's absolutely right when we can make the comparison with public health uh, advertising in other respects, uh, that uh, the evidence uh, between uh, the, for the link between uh, advertising uh, and ill health effects is really strong uh, and the argument has built up over a number of years and what I would be concerned about is if we simply took the view that anything which unfortunately includes an awful lot of things that uh, contribute to uh, carbon emissions ends up being banned in terms of our advertising then the scope of that is far far too broad so I would encourage um, uh, officers and members when they look at the detail of this uh, to really put some definition on it um, up front and, and early and then in addition to that, I think we can go much further than, than the motion is, is talking about because there is the potential for us to take a leadership role in the community and not just focus on our own services and the areas that we directly control, but also think about those of our partners, people that we uh, commission to deliver services for us uh, and others. And I think there's no question that the importance of sending a message on uh, uh, climate emergency and tackling carbon emissions is really critical. And we do need to change the narrative uh, away from the idea that this is something that should be tolerated and is the norm through to something that should be the exception. So I, I do support the motion um, and I encourage colleagues to support it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Do we have any further speakers? Councillor Davis. Thank you. I, I guess I'm going to be the executive member that's going to be doing this, am I, as it's public transport. I'm wholly supportive of, of the point Mike Bell makes. I think it'd be really useful, and I think we should involve all members in this, in defining the, the nature of the products, because I think there's an argument that probably could be made for just for anything we could potentially advertise as an impact on the climate. So I think we need to be very careful and, 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 ma and major on importance and set that, that lead within the community, I fully agreeing with, you know, again, with Mike's points on that. So wholly supportive of the motion. Thanks for bringing it. Uh, Bridget um, at a distance and Stuart and, and Kieran physically here and yes we, we, we need to involve everybody in terms of how, how, how we shape that, um, that that shopping list as it were and I think we also bear in mind that these contracts are for potentially for quite a long time have to have some thoughts on, on future proofing them as well so welcome it and I think we should get it and get it right and set that motion forward thank you any further speakers no. 
I think we can. Oh, uh, would you like to sum up? Very Stuart? briefly, thank you, Chairman. I just want to say thank you to Councillor Bell and Councillor Davis for their, their their support and their contributions. I agree fully that the, we need to have to bound the scope and define which products and services are sufficiently carbon intensive to come under the scope of this policy. I think that's an excellent point, as is the one around how we influence our partners. Thank you for your support. Uh, Councillor James. Thank you. Is it possible to ask whether, do you know the revenue uh, implications of this? Is that being costed at all or anything beforehand before we vote on this? Just for, just for clarity, Councillor James, that was the revenue implications, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Any comment from anybody? Councillor Davis? Well, in inevitably, there will, there will be a revenue issue in terms of that we will have less products that we can potentially advertise on the placard. So there is a potential for that. What it will be, I don't know, but I think there is a, also the plus point around promoting the, you know, the, the wider health of the community of North Somerset. So there is a potential if we use the current um, method of calculation on, on, on revenue, but we are very much aware of the fact we do need to maximise that revenue, but yet also address the, you know, the wider implications, because it'd be great if we got a very large revenue stream in one way, but then massively increased our cost in others, particularly through public health and, and the like. So I think we look, need to look at the net benefit as well. Councillor James. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Ch Chairman, I, I can also add to that for the benefit of members. In the um, concession, the, the, the advertising on the bus shelters is, is done under a concession contract that we let. Um, that is up for um, relet at the moment, hence the, the timing of this, this debate. And what I have suggested to the director is in, in scoping this forward, we might ask for variant bids from, from uh, tenderers to say what, what is the level you would offer for, for various different um, restricted basis so that you, you can actually quantify what, what the what the motion would cost and, and what you might be minded to do. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think I don't think there's any sign of any amendment. So I think we can vote uh, we can move to a vote on the motion as proposed, which has been duly seconded. So I would ask all those in favour of the motion please. Thank you very much. We can now move to uh, item two, oh, sorry, the mo motion two, um, which is planning for the future and the planning bill, which has been published with the agenda. And I'll hand over to Councillor Bell to introduce this. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, obviously, the, mo the wording of the motion uh, is as set out in the agenda papers. Um, I would invite uh, colleagues to indicate that they're happy to debate the motion, and then I would ask my colleagues, uh, Councillor crockford Hawley and Councillor Canniford, to, to speak to it, if that's okay. Absolutely. So, we need to know if seven members wish to carry this forward for debate. Thank you. And that's clearly... The case. So, uh, was it Councillor Crockford Hawley who is the mover? Uh, Chairman, we're in the midst of preparing a local plan, a government required document which will set out North Somerset's vision, will be a framework for addressing housing, employment, and other needs, and crucially, will be a platform for local people to help shape their surroundings. Government has ordered us to find room for more than 20,500 new homes by 2038, which equates to 1,369 new houses each year. That's way above our preferred target of 1,049, and even this lower figure is challenging since we are currently building only 808 per annum. To put this government requirement into context, it would be the equivalent of building two new Clevedons by the time I reach my 90th birthday. Not many years away. We have overwhelming constraints on where to build. Greenbelt, Flood Zone 3 and the AONB leave us precious little land with acceptable development potential. And the mere concept of acceptability will of course need to be put to full council and public scrutiny. Wherever the pen falls on the map of North Somerset, 
we councillors of all political persuasions and of none will cause disquiet amongst ourselves and incur shared public wrath. We'll not be able to shy away from the responsibilities. There'll be no cowardly straddling the abstention fence. Our party political allegiances will count for naught. We will, every one of us, Mr. Chairman, need to decide yea or nay when proposed site allocations begin to appear. For every councillor and citizen who objects to one site, there'll be the need to reallocate, reallocate housing elsewhere. This is going to be a bumpy ride for everyone, and responsibility, Mr. Chairman, will weigh heavily on all our shoulders. The situation has been made more difficult because we are not in charge of our own destiny. It matters not which party one belongs to, since Westminster and Whitehall always choose to keep local government on a tight leash. Currently, government thinking augurs against councils making up their own minds about their own housing requirements. And I'm sorry to say the weasel words spouted by the likes of Messrs Jenrick, Fox and Penrose do nothing to help. They are besotted by the Dominic Cummings algorithm which reasons that all new homes should be built where people want to live and in so doing prices will fall and the dream of home ownership will be extended to a younger conservative voting generation currently locked out of the market. Where do Penrose and Fox suggest we build these 20,500 new homes? Penrose has said, build up, not out, clearly going for the rural vote. As for Fox, I've no idea, but he tells us the figures are only for guidance. Mr. Chairman, try telling that to a planning inspector. Less than a year ago, Penrose wrote in one of his chatty but informationally deficient mercury pieces that if enough of us speak up, they won't be able to ignore what we say, they being this council. It was a blatant attempt to misguide the public into thinking this council has the final say in how many houses are developed here. In my response, I invited him to give evidence to our scrutiny panel. He hasn't, but the invitation remains open. The situation in England is indefensible. In the past decade, 2,782,300 homes have been granted planning permission, but only 1,627,300 have been built. Land which has been already allocated in local plans for more than a million new homes has not yet progressed to planning application stage, let alone sod shoveling, but government persists in telling us there's a lack of land availability. So, Who's sitting on this land? Answer, the volume house builders. In the words of Liam Halligan, writing in this month's copy of The Spectator, Barrett, Countryside, Persimmon and Taylor Wimpy have formed a cartel deliberately slowing down construction. Four-fifths of residential planning applications are approved in England, but big developers hoover up these permits and then sit on them keeping both demand and prices artificially high, much to the satisfaction of their shareholders and one political party which benefits hugely from gleeful and grateful handouts. An investigation by Open Democracy established that by June 2020, the Conservative Party had been handed £11 million by some of the country's richest developers and construction businesses. Bloor Homes gave nearly a million pounds. Countrywide Developments gave three quarters of a million. For a paltry 50,000 per annum, a developer can have an off-the-record chat with the Prime Minister or sign up to CPF, the Conservative Property Forum, which acc with access to important politicians at cosy breakfast gatherings. It's cash for access and utterly immoral. Not that morality much troubles the soul of our beloved Prime Minister. Alex Morton, former Downing Street housing advisor, claims these big boys carve up land ensuring land values rise from, say, £20,000 per hectare to anything between £2 million and £3 million in return for nothing beyond breaking ground. 
Michael Forsyth, Chairman of the House of Lords Economic Affairs Select Committee said, the UK's big developers have become far too powerful. The whole rotten process incentivizes these big boys to acquire and control land. The six largest hold over a million building plots and 90% of those are controlled by the biggest three, Taylor Wimpy, Barrett and Persimmon. Before the 2008 financial crash, thousands of small and medium-sized companies built three quarters of new homes. There was true competition and turnaround was relatively quick. Competition has disappeared. It's now a carve-up between a builder's mafiosi. In 2018, Persimmon returned profits above a billion pounds and even during lockdown managed a 2020 return of 863 million. They operate on something like, I believe, a 30% profit margin. Not bad. The House of Lords summed it up succinctly. In terms of the quality of homes built and consumer misery, these companies produce outcomes that are really quite nasty. This is not how capitalism is supposed to work. Now, Chairman, it's laudable of Secretary of State Jenrick to say home ownership should be achievable for all who dream of it, but what is the end product? The quality, the pattern book dreariness, the shoddiness of dangerous structures and extortionate repair costs, the cladding fiasco, the always late provision of infrastructure so important to building sustainable communities, the utterly indefensible and outdated English le leasehold noose strangling the necks of owners who wish to move elsewhere but can't sell. Millennials now pay more towards their first home over their lifetime than any other generation. Falling interest rates have not offset rising house prices. When I bought my first home in 1973, the average cost equivalent in today's prices was £154,000. Today that figure is £254,000 and this, despite sorry, 254,000, and this despite the 1974 net mortgage interest being 90,000 pounds compared with today's 63,000. It means actual costs have risen by two thirds. I have not made up these figures. It's the result of an analysis by the Resolution Foundation. Owner occupation rates amongst the 25 to 34 year olds have fallen from 70% in the mid 1990s to 40% now. House prices have grown faster than earnings. House share, help to buy and leaseholds are not the answer. Selling council houses was a travesty, which though allowing some people to own the homes in which they were brought up, has allowed others to make fortunes. Councils can be slow dealing with planning applications, but drill down and speed is quite frequently the result of dilatory applicants. The true cost of processing large planning applications is now heavily subsidized by the public purse. Between 2010 and 2018, there was a 37.9% fall in net current expenditure on English planning functions, despite increased activity. If planning fees were set locally rather than by Whitehall, the process could become self-financing. Genric's proposal for a fully digitized planning system could produce a more accessible and efficient service, and virtual planning meetings should not be ruled out simply because so-called Freedom Day has arrived, though issues such as digital exclusion will need to be thought through carefully. Where land with planning permission lies dormant, Councils should have power to step in and charge full council tax. And government should create a new, more streamlined compulsory purchase power order. Um, a new regulation is called for. To sum up, is the planning system faulty? Answer, yes. Will the planning white paper change things? Yes. But like the curate's egg, it's a mixed offer. I look forward to embracing the aims of the Building Beautiful com uh, Commission, but fear the automatic right to develop in a zone system will antagonize many a constituent. We must offer praise where it is due, express concern where we find fault, and state unequivocally where government proposals will be detrimental to local well-being. To use the German, 
we should not embrace ver schlimm besserung, which, as you will all know, means an improvement that makes things worse. Thank you, Chairman. I beg to move. Thank you, uh, Councillor Crockett Hawley. Uh, if Councillor Canniford wasn't up to second it, then I'd second you myself. Councillor Canniford. Yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to second that. And, and really, uh, Councillor Crockford Hawley's left me with little to say, so I will um, say little. But there are a couple of things I think is important to highlight through this discussion. And I think many of us understand the difficulties your Conservative administration had previously regarding housing numbers. Um, and it, isn't it obvious, so what frightens me uh, quite a bit from our MPs beforehand, before 2019, they were completely quiet about uh, housing numbers. So I wonder what's changed since then, and I don't think we have to think too far to notice what's changed since then. Uh, our MP in the north of the district is giving out advice, telling the people and the residents in his constituency that housing numbers are only a guide. I have written to him on two occasions now and asked him to confirm that with the Minister. Uh, on both occasions, he has refused to reply and just said, read the Act. Uh, the figures aren't clearly in the Act, they are set up by government. Um, however, there are um, some major concerns I think that even we should be concerned about, and, uh, and not just the numbers, because clearly uh, Councillor Crockford Hawley uh, eloquently put the, the fact is if people don't want housing uh, in certain areas, they will simply have to find areas where they can have housing because if we are forced to build houses, they will be built. But I think the idea of moving, removing the residents' rights to object is simply against the democracy that we all sit within. And, and I find this unpleasant coming from a government who seems to be hell-bent on removing that voice. Removing Section 106, well, that's fine if they give us the money to build the infrastructure, but they don't. And we are all aware of that, regardless of what political persuasion that you are from. And what we really want, and I think John did touch on it, is we want homes that are quality, inspirational, and people want to live in them. People want to go to those homes because that's a good home to live in. And we have the opportunity to start doing that, but many too many of us draw lines where that simply won't happen because one, they'll make it too expensive when it doesn't need to be, it's just a different way of doing things. And that's what we need to be seeing all over this country. So I'm pleased to second the motion. Thank you, Councillor Canniford. Uh, we've had indications from a few people. Uh, so I think it was Councillor Gibbons with a hand up first. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that obviously we in the Labour group agree and support this. I mean, you will know that the opposition in Parliament has characterised the planning reforms as a developer's charter. So we fully stand against um, many of the objectives of this uh, so-called reform. Um, and I agree with everything that my two colleagues have just said. I'd just like to highlight, um, if I may, the point in the motion where we are concerned by the failure to recognize the climate emergency by making it a key priority that would enable the planning system to respond to climate crisis. And I think that that should be one of the key points that we as a council should be pushing forward. I think none of us can fail to have been moved by the heartbreaking scenes of the devastation in Germany just recently with flooding. And we've had flooding in the West Country over years. I don't think any of us can doubt the, the real danger we all face from the climate emergency. So my request is, could we strengthen our objection to their failure to address that in these planning reforms, please? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. I think it was Councillor McQuillan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you to the Lib Dem group for an excellent motion. And like uh, Councillor Gibbons, I fully agree with everything said. Um, I think the other, the ang other angle I would want to emphasise briefly is how the unrealistic targets coming from the government model in the context of North Somerset, where you have, as you've said, that the Green Belt, 
the floodplains, the area's national beauty and everything else. At its worst, it sets communities against communities and it puts the council in an incredibly difficult position. It puts parish councils in incredibly difficult positions. So fully in support of this motion, um, I don't want to see communities divided. I want communities to be in the driving seat and not beholden to flawed government models. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Councillor Cartman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you um, to Councillor Crockford Hawley. E excellent speech as normal. I'm going to make a couple of additional comments. I I'm going to be kind to the government to start with and then perhaps draw, draw a distinction between those at the top of the government and perhaps Conservative voters, supporters, commentators, indeed councillors. The intention is right. 300,000 houses a year for the country is a good thing to do to improve the design and look of those properties, which again is part of the white paper, is a good intention, um, as is the idea of trying to unblock the planning system, although I accept it doesn't need that much unblocking when there's a million homes already with planning permission. I think that, that the unique thing about this is that the fact that a lot of Conservative voters are upset about it. Um, look at the Chesham and Amersham by-election that came out on the doorstep quite a lot. And I'm hoping that we're worrying a lot of MPs in the so-called blue wall, including my local MP, Dr. Fox, who, is, as Councillor Canniford said, has steadfastly refused to justify his public comments against the council and has manifestly misled his constituents, in my opinion, and put pressure on him to pressurise the government into changing this because it's a bit of a disaster. I also know the LGA was universal in its condemnation of these, these proposals, and that's all groups. That's Lib Dem, Labour, Conservative, and the Independent Group, and the Greens all oppose these for their lack of removal of local democracy, and the fact is they fundamentally don't work and don't seek to solve the problems um, as we see them, which is that the construction industry is indeed much turning into a cartel. And I think I'd say one final quote which came to mind, um, Adam Smith is possibly the world's greatest ever Scotsman said, and a famous economist for those who don't know him, and very influential on my MP I know, said, people of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. I would say, on that note, he was predicting our current troubles very accurately. We need to address the, the problem and the cartel in the housing industry. I would like to say I support this wholeheartedly, but I wouldn't want this to come across in any sense that we are against house building in North Somerset. We've had two speakers today who have both talked about the need to solve this, and we must make sure that we are not in uh, a glass house throwing stones. I believe we are tackling this and we are looking at challenging sites. And I think later on today, we'll be talking about the Upland site in Nailsey. And I know that's very controversial, but at the very least, it shows our willingness to look in difficult areas for housing for our people. And I think that needs to be made clear when we write to our MPs that we are not saying not here. We are saying, let's us do our fair share and let us have the power to do that for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartman. Um, I think the solicitor has got a comment to relay from Councillor Ashton. Chairman, thank you. Yes, uh, Councillor Ashton, not being able to be here, asked for the following to be, be made on this submission. Variations of this proposal are going to most councils across the country over the next few weeks. Following the letter from Stephen Reid, MP, that was circulated at the recent LGA conference, and the speech by Robert Jenrick, who has genuinely acknowledged many of the concerns. Much of your proposal is what we have all been arguing for, either through the LGA or directly with various ministers. So I do support your bullet points at the end on giving local authorities greater powers. Mike Keeley, the chairman of the Planning Officers Society, who I thought gave one of the best presentations of the conference, commented, the white paper contained very little detail, making it hard to debate, and the notion they, planning committees, just deal with principles and not details, I think is a loss of democracy, and it's not something that I could support. The white paper has now been delayed probably until the end of the year in response to pressure from the LGA and many local authorities. The Secretary of State did mention that when the review of the white paper is completed, it will be clear that, one, local communities will have more say in local development and planning applications with more weight being given to local plans. Two, there is no suggestion that the public will lose the right to object. How could anyone stop it? But I do question the term object. We often object, but then get overturned by inspectors following impossible, unneeded housing targets that just carry forward. 
We should be asking for more powers to refuse, not just object. I have always thought if local authorities set their own housing needs, they would be more likely to be built, and when a permission is granted, instead of a meaningless start date, there should be a phased build schedule. When developers argue that there's a need for a permission, they should get on and build it. Three, on any new levy replacing SIL and Section 106, it was made clear that this would be set locally, not nationally, but there was some sort of framework or process to stop rates being so set, set, set so high as to make any development unviable. However, the new work bill will be wide-ranging, permissions in principle, some sort of zoning, but not called zoning, and a change in quotas, for example, have all been mentioned. I accept you cannot mention everything, but one point raised several times was the obvious need there will be for planning departments to take on additional work and new skills. I think we need to press at every opportunity that we obtain real funding for what could be substantial additional resources needed in an already stretched department. Would you add this to your concerns, preferably at the top? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I think we've got one more person wishing to speak, Councillor Bridger. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't disagree with anything that Councillor Ashton uh, said there um, and with any of the previous speakers. But I think the, you know, the, what's, what's, whatever comes forward in the, the planning bill, I think, um, I think it will still be focused on targets. But I think the real, if there, you know, we obviously do need more houses, quite a substantial number of new houses. But I think the real housing crisis is, is one of affordability. And I think what, what the, the kind of system we seem to be locked into and that we're seeing in North Somerset, for example, is where we're building a kind, of, a kind of house which largely encourages migration into North Somerset, which does, do, which does nothing actually to reduce the affordability uh, sort of impact, the affordability crisis. Picking up on what Councillor Gibbons was saying, I, we certainly, certainly shouldn't think play off affordability with sustainability. We need both. We need affordable homes and, and, and houses uh, and development which, which is sustainable. As an aside, I, I do kind of wonder what the end point to all this will be. And I'm thinking not just of obviously without with the emerging local plan, the one where that's in development, it's already demonstrating to all of us that there's very little land left um, to build on because of the constraints of, of, of Greenbelt, the AOMB and, and, and the floodplain. What happens with the, flood, uh, the um, local plan after this one? Will we, you know, and the one after that? <laughs> you know, what, what's, I have no idea what the end game is. So to me, that tells me we have to be much, or well, given the freedom to be much more imaginative of how we use existing stock and, and brownfield. You know, that, that has to be um, front and center, I think, because otherwise there'll be, there'll be you know, literally nowhere else to build the new houses that are proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bridger. Um, anybody else who wishes to speak? I can, oh, somebody's got their hand up there. Sorry, I can't see who you are. Oh, it's, it's, it's Councillor Pepperell. Councillor Pepperell. Thank you, I thought, I thought you hadn't seen me. Um, for a long time, regardless of government, um, when you give your housing figures, it has to be the houses that have been built. And we've often talked about the idea that actually, if we've given permission to a developer, we ought to be able to count those figures as well. And I think it's a subject which councils should keep on at government about. I don't think it's fair. Um, and, you know, I'd really like to see that rule changed. I think it'd be a great help. But the other thing is, regardless of how many houses we've got to build, please, please, can we stop building on floodplains? Um, if you go out of Western, you go past the crematorium at Whirl. The road then goes down a hill, and then if you look to the left, there's a field which every winter is underwater. But sure enough, developers have put in for planning permission there, and our planners are seriously considering it. They're saying, so what are you going to do about the planning? I believe they're going to make a hole in the roof or something. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous, and I really think we should stop doing that. Thank you, Councillor Pepperell. My apologies. I'm looking at you through three screens, so you disappear a bit. Um, I don't think we've had any real um, disagreement with the, with the um, 
um, motion as, as stated. Uh, so I will ask uh, Councillor Crockford Hawley to sum up before we move to a vote. Thank you, Chairman. I summed up in my opening statement, so I've got nothing else to say um, other than, of course, we're not against housing. Of course, we're not against development. We, we have got to provide more housing. But we, as a local authority, want to be in charge of that and not being told by central government where to do it and how to do it. Um, and I sense today, with all the conversations and, and with um, Councillor Ashton's input um, from afar, um, that we all actually agree. So I, I find this really progressive. So the enemy is not the party. The enemy is Whitehall and Westminster. They've got to learn, and we're all going to tell them. Thank you, Chairman. I hope people will support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Crawford Hawley. Uh, I think we can move to the vote then. So all those in favour of the motion as it stands. Yes, that's clearly carried. Thank you. So we will move on to matters referred from previous meetings, of which there are none. Chairman's announcements. I hadn't intended to say anything, but there are two things that need saying, sort of, I suppose. The first one is that um, it's worth noting that we will have a new member uh, after Thursday's by-election result is in. We don't know who this is, of course, but uh, there will be somebody after Thursday, which I think will bring us back up to uh, full complement. The second meeting, uh, sorry, the second announcement is uh, one from myself, which is uh, to do with the civic service. I had proposed having the civic service on the 26th of September. I've postponed this uh, on advice, as it were, until next year. And I will let everybody know when that's going to be once the, um, the ritual year of the Anglican Church is announced next year. So, uh, on we go then to leaders' announcements. Councillor Davis. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the team that have got this room ready for, to, for the meeting today. I mean, it seems to me that we are very well segregated and operating in, in as safe way as possible. Disappointingly, of course, several members can't join us for, for reasons which I fully understand because of the government not renewing the distance meetings rules which they seem to have kept for themselves but not for anybody else and that's caused major major inconvenience to everybody so thank you to the team for getting this place ready and our thanks for all the work they're going to have to do afterwards to get ready for the airport appeal tomorrow in my final piece will just be a plea to everybody watching um, numbers of covid cases are still going up despite it being so-called freedom day today so let's please please do everything we can to look after each other and keep us all safe so thank you Thank you, Councillor Davis. Uh, Chief Executive's announcements, Jo. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank members, actually, because I'm seeing you in person for the first time, and um, many of you for a long time, for all, all your work, along with all, all of my staff, um, for their hard work and commitment in responding to the pandemic over the last 16 months. But I did feel it's important to let members be aware that we continue to see the impacts of, of COVID in our communities whether that's an increase in, in children and adults' mental health referrals, uh, delays in elective surgery causing reduced health and mobility, or carer breakdown um, as examples. So quite a lot of demand um, across our services, which continues. Um, as the leader has outlined, our COVID numbers locally continue to rise as they do nationally. So we will continue as an employer to take a cautious approach to how we work. Um, along with many other employers in response to the changes um, and has been well trailed in the media over the last week, we will continue to work in an agile and a hybrid way. Um, we'll be encouraging staff to work from home where possible given our numbers and we will be encouraging the public to wear masks in our public spaces and use hand sanitizer, etc. to try and mitigate the spread of COVID. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, 
Right, we can move on to um, the forward plan, uh, dated 2nd of July 2021, which was published with the agenda. Over to you, Councillor Davis, again. Well, thank you. I propose adoption. Yeah. That's just to be noted, thank so you. it is. On to item 12, the policy and scrutiny panel reports. There are none, or well, there is none. Um, item 13, corporate parenting, which has been published with the agenda. And over to Councillor Gibbons to present. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that members have, have read this, but um, this is part of our regular update to you all as corporate parents, because every single one of you is a corporate parent to our children, whether looked after or uh, indeed you are champions for all the children across North Somerset. So here we've got um, an update on the findings for the uh, Your Life Beyond Care survey, which took place this year. The last one was in 2018. And I'd like to thank the Director of Children's Services, Sheila Smith, for pulling together this precy for us so that we get a, a snapshot of what was revealed in that, as well as um, a briefing on the case for change, but I'll come to that later. So reading through um, the responses, we had 96 young people who responded, which is around, well, it's just over half. Um, and it was a pretty even split between male and female. I think it was slightly more girls that um, responded and others who were transgender or gender fluid. And what I think is a little concerning is that 39% of our care leavers report having a disability or a long-term issue, which is a, a large proportion compared to other authorities. And I know from speaking to the young people that um, very commonly anxiety and other mental health issues are a serious concern for us. On the plus side, um, many more care leavers have trusted people in their lives. Um, they're reporting they have friends, they're feeling much more sort of stable and they all know who their social worker is. And they find them easier to contact than they did last time and the ones who were satisfied with their life have slightly increased and they feel safe where they live. But um, there are things we can still do better as, as you've read. And, highlight stress that people are suffering and I don't think that's going to have improved uh, during this pandemic so we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that their well-being is increased. Um, the corporate parenting panel obviously will receive a detailed report of this and I would just say to you that I know a number of you attended an LGA webinar on the 23rd of June, which addressed uh, life after care and care leaving and had a very good presentation from um, an expert called Mark Riddell. And we were very fortunate the week before that webinar to have him visit us and visit our care living team, speak to the young people and the service leaders and give, he, give us uh, his insights into what more we can do to make life better for our children in care and care leavers above all. And to, has, and to highlight that the service is regarded as good by Ofsted, but we would like to be outstanding in that area. As you'll also see, um, we're referencing almost a year ago, the fact that we had a briefing and so many of you who came to that briefing about our children's services and the children in care offered uh, a wide range of, of things that could help our young people. And it hasn't been forgotten. Now that things are kind of becoming a little bit easier, we are working through these kind offers. And you, if you haven't been contacted already with what you offered and having a discussion with somebody about how it can be taken forward, you will be. So uh, be assured that everything was very much appreciated. And indeed, if anyone has anything else to offer, then please get in touch. Finally, we mentioned at the last corporate parenting briefing, the case for change. Um, it's, or rather, we mentioned the children's social care review and the first publication came out just recently and called the case for change, 
by jo uh, Josh McAllister. And this is a national review, and I won't go through point by point all the findings. But what I will say to you is that in the, if you haven't read the case for change, I think that the first paragraph sums up everything we should be about. I completely agree when Josh, Josh McAllister says that children's social care isn't just a system, it's a collective endeavor involving all of us. And we have, to an extent, stepped back from playing our full part in the way that we need to. Some of this is because the system pushes help away from neighbors, extended family, and the wider community. But if we are being honest with ourselves, it is also because we have backed away from our mutual obligations to one another to range, raise future generations as a community. And this needs to change. Now, I think we're doing really well in North Somerset in thinking about community and thinking about our children as part of our community. And we can certainly do much more. I just ask you, if you can, to read the case for change and to bear in mind some of its findings and look at the actions that the review will undertake going forward and the further questions. And if you want any advice or help on how you might perhaps contribute to this review, please get in touch. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Councillor Gibbons? Can't say any. Oh, there's one from the leader. Well, I'd just like to thank Catherine for bringing this item along to each meeting. I just think it's key. It's a key importance to our, us, us as, a, as an organisation. And I'm just really pleased that she's done that. And also thank you to colleagues who have offered to make um, help towards you know, the, looking after our, our children. And we've got a question from Councillor James. Thank you, Arach. This is really interesting and useful. Um, I was just concerned about the, um, obviously the recent news articles about fostering in North Somerset and about our corporate children's parents who, or, or guardians who haven't received payment for fostering. So could you sort of provide some context about that? Because that was quite concerning to hear, as I imagine a lot of the other corporate parents would think here. Yes, I, I did notice that case. In fact, I, I had been forewarned of that particular case. There have been um, three, uh, two or three, if not more, across the country of similar cases, and it was historic. I mean, we are talking about an issue that went back to 2010 that has finally been resolved. And of course, you know, I regret, as, you, as all of us, that this, this happened, and it is thankfully dealt with now. But I don't have any indications that there's anything coming forward that's got a more recent history to it. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just before we move on, uh, I just note that um, I've had a booklet through the post on corporate parenting, so uh, all of us councillors have a responsibility as corporate parents and we have homework, dare I say. So, um, that one's just for noting. Uh, so, we'll note it. Thank you very much, Councillor Gibbons. Question time. Uh, and I just remind you that if you do have a question, can you please uh, jot it down and supply it to the uh, chairman's desk um, so that we've got a, a, a reference for the minutes. Um, sorry, I, is, I can't see who you are. Could you, could you state your name, please? Yeah. Uh, it's Robert Payne. Councillor Payne, of course it is. Sorry, Councillor Payne. Honestly, it's, I, I, the angle I've got here just distorts people's faces sure I understand um, I've got a question if I may for the for the leader um, as he's the executive member for public transport um, the uh, a3 bus from Western Supermare to Bristol Airport which is a service commissioned by the airport under contract has been suspended for some months now which we can probably understand due to the reduction in use of the airport during the pandemic but some um, 
Are you concerned that uh, the airport is now making no commitment to restart this service, although things are starting to open up now and since the airport is actively trying to get people to get back to flying? Um, the only way that people can access the airport from uh, the western area is by going through central Bristol, and that can't be done at all for early morning flights. So do you agree with me that this encourages more people to go to the airport by car, which is the opposite of what the airport has told us they are trying to achieve? Thank, Sir Davis. You. Thank you, Robert. I was actually speaking to the chief executive of the airport last week, and I did raise with him the whole issue about bus services more generally. And he said he would go away and, and, and look at this, the provision of the services that they provide specifically for airport travel. So I have no, I have no definite answer on when it's going to, uh, to restart to Robert, but I did remind him that um, we did think the public transport provision was a key part of the delivery to, to the community that they, they had offered to us. I can certainly ask the public transport team to, to keep us updated. Going to the pain, is that uh, sufficient? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leader. Right. Councillor James, and then the solicitor's got something to say. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, I read with real sadness the Ofsted and CQC's report on the 16th of June on special educational needs and education. The report highlighted a lack of strategic direction and planning by senior leaders across this authority to implement SEND reforms, special educational needs and uh, uh, education, um, for, uh, through an effective SEND strategy. Uh, they said that attempts to introduce change have been ineffective, um, insufficient and inconsistent, which was really sad to hear because I know the work that's been going on. It also highlighted that stability has been a strength locally and that so blame culture that damages that stability might not be helpful. But how will the council change? What will be different in our approach after this really damaging Ofsted report? Councillor Gibbons, I know this is mainly historical, but I'll hand it over to you. Yes. Um, firstly, I'd have to clarify that when they talk about um, the issues you mentioned in terms of uh, the leadership, it is not specifically the council. They're talking about a system here which involves partners, uh, the CCG and education partners. So across the board, as I'm sure you're well aware, we've, we've had a few um, issues with the CCG in terms of provision, and they themselves have admitted that they've had one or two challenges, um, which I think I'd like to say um, will be addressed, certainly in uh, the accelerated action plan that we are in the process of formulating that is addressed, and we've had some very good conversations with the CCG in terms of uh, getting key people in positions, which has now happened. Um, I want to just remind me what else, what were the other key points you uh, raised so, up? So obviously there's the full letter, but yes, basically yes. It, uh, I mean, what they've said is that yes, the changes I, I know, to date are ineffective, uh, insufficient and inconsistent across the different areas. What we had were the eight points that were raised in the original inspection in 2018 before this administration came in. And then we had the revisit, which unfortunately and disappointingly for us found that we had only, if you like, ticked off two of those areas. We were, I would say, um, it's pointless to say you're close because you either do it or you don't. But yes, there were the six areas that we still need to have work on, and it's those areas that we are working at pace to address with the Accelerated Action Plan, which will be published shortly. Is it all right just to have the one follow-up, yep. uh, which is just, are you confident that we are now going to do something different enough that we're, our new approach is going to be enough to inspire that check because that was a really damn so enough to give us a better reputation and uh, give us the trust to send parents i i would say i'm confident that we've got the 
foundations, if you like, there. Obviously, we are not acting alone. We are acting with key partners, and we all have to work together. I'm also confident that the atmosphere with, within the team, if you like, is very positive, and I think that there's a real willingness to work together. We, we are sort of sitting at the table and feeling we are all together in this. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful. Let's hope we have got things into a right framework that we can do better for these families and their children because, I mean, it, it matters. It matters to me, it matters to you. It's a really important area we have to succeed in. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your openness there. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, are there any more questions? I don't think so. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Solicitor. Yeah, um, uh, the solicitor wants to bring something up from uh, one of the councillors who isn't here. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Bryant has uh, asked uh, me to, to lodge this question on his behalf. He's, uh, he's asked me to put it to the leader for him, although I think actually the correct portfolio is that of Councillor Canniford. Um, but I will read out the question and leave colleagues uh, from the councillors to determine. So he says, on Friday last, I was privileged to meet with Julian Turner, Chief Executive Officer of Westfield Technology Group, and Dr. Paul Phillips, Principal of Western College, to examine and experience at first hand an autonomous vehicle or pod. Westfield Technology Group is one of the UK's leading autonomous vehicle providers, and globally they are known for their niche sports cars with over 20,000 sold worldwide. The pod has been developed in conjunction with Heathrow Airport and has now completed over 5 million kilometers in a live commercial environment serving Heathrow Airport Terminal 5, known as pod parking. The vision is to bring pod to Western Supermare as an added benefit to the town and an attraction to its many visitors. Initially, it would operate a service from the new bus terminal currently being built, extending into the town and along Marine Parade. This innovative idea has a number of benefits, the first of which is to help and assist in the reduction of global warming. Last but certainly not least, the pods would arrive in modular form to be built by the college, providing a hands-on approach for the mechanical, electrical, and electronic engineering students who hopefully you agree would, who, which hopefully you agree would be a huge benefit. Unfortunately, all creative ideas such as this require inward investment, and I ask if the leader will ask officers to make contact with Dr. Paul Phillips and his team to see if the council can assist both practically and financially. I'll say, I think that might be Councillor Canniford with the inward investment and economic hat on, or it could potentially be the leader with the transport hat on. Um, it could even that. be Councillor Gibbons with her skills hat on, but I think to, to, to even it up, I think Councillor Bell's going to answer it. <laughs> yes, I think, I, I think Councillor Bell wants to say something before the leader responds. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one on the basis that it's absolutely nothing to do with me. Um, but what I will say is I went and, and participated in the, in the demonstration of the pods at, at the weekend by Western College as part of their future tech event. So um, I'm, I am completely aware of what Councillor Bryant is talking about. Um, and for those that you know, aren't clear from the question, it was some autonomous vehicles which have been piloted at, at larger shopping centers and airports and so on, which you basically get in and they plow their own furrow automatically down, down, con conveying people uh, down a, a preset route. Um, so yeah, absolutely interesting idea, um, and uh, I'll be very happy to take it away and talk to relevant officers to see whether it's something we can explore. Um, my only caveat would be that the uh, the going rate for one of these pods is between 150 and 250 thousand uh, pounds, and they only and they only carry four people, by the way, per pod. Um, so it might be a pretty pricey way uh, of improving uh, public transport in Western. But I think we can definitely look at it. Uh, and there might well be some option around leasing something or, or a trial, uh, an extended trial that we could run uh, with the college and with um, Westfield Technology that uh, might help to put us on the map um, and, uh, and achieve something a bit different. So um, thank you, Councillor Bryant, for raising it. Councillor Davis, do you need to say anything? Only that I witnessed one of these Westfields whizzing around Castle Coombe a couple of weeks ago, but that's the only important thing I can make. So, 
we've got a note or should have a note of all of the uh, questions and I think we can uh, we can move on then to item 15 uh, reports and matters referred from the executive of the 23rd of June 2021 there are apparently none so we're on to item 16 uh, reports and matters referred from the policy stroke overview and scrutiny panels and number one there is the peer review member working group which has been published with the agenda and I would invite um, I would invite uh, Richard Kent uh, to come forward uh, for this item and I'll hand over to councillor Crockford Hawley to present uh, sure. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't intend going through the paper. You've got it in front of you. You've all read it, inwardly digested it, and you're going to fire away with questions. i just highlight um, a, a number of points which I think do need to be highlighted. Um, um, obviously, to thank everybody who participated. Um, I expected uh, to be grilled a little more by the, the people who'd come to see us, but it was quite a, quite a civilised um, affair. Um, it's the, they were external reviewers, of course, and, and um, many of the recommendations are for the, the, the director to implement rather than for um, members, so that, that is clearly being, being done. Um, I personally remain somewhat concerned that career advancement is not always possible in this relatively small council uh, where we do need to think a bit more about how we retain younger staff by widening their professional development opportunities and staff capacity resilience is sometimes stretched um, i think particularly and we all know we have examples with planning enforcement where we can get very frustrated sometimes uh, and and it's largely due to um, not having sufficient staff to meet our expectations um, on the, on the points which I think are probably going to be of greatest interest to members, um, it, it probably uh, boils down to the membership uh, of the Planning and Regulatory Committee. Um, you don't need me to tell you that our planning committee has been excessively large. I mean, one of the largest in, in, in the country. It, it's, it is unwieldy. Um, it's cumbersome. Uh, and the recommendation of the peer review that we retain the number we have established during the lockdown, that is 13, um, is, 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 the same, is the figure we are recommending. Um, it's a manageable figure. Um, it has to accommodate political balance. We're statutorily uh, obliged to do that, so every party um, has an input. Um, what we have decided, is, what we are recommending, is, is that even though we have 13 on the, on the new Planning and Regulatory Committee, we will always make room for the ward member to come and address the planning committee on a matter which relates to his or her ward or the adjoining ward which may have an impact on his or her ward. I think that's, that's important. Um, obviously, non-members can't vote. They, they currently can't vote, and, and so they, they won't. Um, the call-in process, um, we do need to ensure that members who are inclined to call in a planning application to be determined by the committee really ought to go through the process of discussing it beforehand with the relevant officer and the chairman of the planning and regulatory committee just to see if we all understand why it's being called to committee we have had some instances in the past where things have just turned up for no apparent reason other than somebody wants it called in um, there has to be justification for the the call in um, one of the changes we, we are recommending, certainly on public participation, we all know when members of the public come to address us, particularly in this chamber, which is not the easiest of rooms in which to have a conversation, uh, members of the public will address the planning committee at the beginning of the meeting. And if, say, you've got half a dozen people who want to address the committee, there are half a dozen statements being made by the applicant, by the objector, so that might be 12 sets of, of speeches 
And if you look around the chamber, we've all seen this, members are shuffling their papers, answering their emails, not really paying attention to the public bench, which is unsatisfactory. And so the recommendation that each person who wishes to address us about a planning application should do so just before that application is being discussed, rather than at the beginning of the meeting. I think that will, that will help us, um, it will help our attention, I think, uh, to be a little more proficient than it has been in, in the past. And if I could just remind members um, that, of course, there is a balance to be met, isn't there, between the rights and the expectations of both applicants and residents. We have to get that balance right. And we have to realize, as difficult as it is at times, that we are not delegates from one side or the other. We cannot be delegated by our parishes or by our communities to vote one way or the other. That's the weight of responsibility we have on our shoulders. And sometimes the decisions we make, we don't like making them, and they are unpopular. But we have to take planning rules and law into account when we determine applications. So I, I commend this peer review to you. I'm happy to answer any questions and hope at the end of the day um, this will be our way forward. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, we're um, proposing that you move the recommendations, Councillor Crawford Hawley. You're okay to do that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And therefore, I will look for a seconder. I'm quite then, happy to second it, Chairman. Councillor Tonkins seconded it. And then we will move to some debate. Um, so we've got Councillor Cartman and then Councillor McQuillan, I believe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, John. That's great. I think my, mine is to do with recommendation 12 on the enforcement. I know we've had a brief conversation about this, but you know, my experience as a councillor, I'm sure many will share this, is one thing that annoys residents most is when planning permission is granted, often against perhaps what they want, only to find the applicant subsequently doesn't adhere to that permission, breaks the planning, and then the enforcement in their mind is less than satisfactory. I have seen some great examples of our enforcement team working to counter these, but nonetheless they are, in my view, under-resourced. Um, I welcome the recommendations here to work closer with parishes to prioritise, but I am slightly worried that it talks about, in recommendation terms, identify efficiencies and work on priority cases. Um, I would perhaps like both uh, John Crawford Hawley and Councillor Tonkin um, to bear in mind this may be an under-resourcing of the department and to keep that in mind when considering it further in their working group. Can they assure me this will be the case? Because this is something of great importance to a lot of my residents. Thank you, Councillor Cartman. Stuart. Thank you, Chairman. I'm fully supportive of this report. Just wanted to sort of pick out a few points and uh, potentially seek some further clarity. Um, I welcome the point on internal consultees. Certainly my experience is sometimes the planning team is some, often waiting for reports from other officers uh, and that can cause bottlenecks. In, in particular, it seems ecological reports, which are increasingly important, of course, in deciding planning decisions and can sometimes be as wide as the children's directorate as well. So I, I think that's a really important point and I wanted to emphasise that and welcome that it's in the report and I hope that the officers are able to address that point. The second point I wanted to, to talk about was the, the call-in process. I welcome the comments in the report there. I think that's an area that could do with some more clarity. Uh, members are often under pressure, let's say, to call in applications for various reasons, and any clarity and guidance in this area to both members and the wider community, I think, would be very much welcomed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Davis. Thank you. And I think I'd like to say, first of all, thanks to the LGA team who came in and, get, and, and did the, the, the peer review. I think they did a, a really good piece of work. And, and then on top of that, I'd like to thank uh, John and James, who have led, I think, a really exemplary piece of consultation with members and going through the issues and producing a document here that addresses those issues raised in the, in the peer review and having spoken at length with colleagues as to how we can implement those and also address their concerns. So thank you very much, all of you, for that. And I also wholly support the idea of this triaging before anything is brought to the, to the, um, to the committee. I think that um, 
we do need to do that so we, we make sure that we actually decide important and important can be small as well as large planning applications in the appropriate scenario rather than rather than for reasons which are and sometimes not clear as to why items arrive at the at the committee so thank you very much for what you've done support the comments you're making i think we do need to do a little bit more in terms of the triaging i think as you already hinted at in terms of items arriving at the committee and i do agree that the point ash cartman is making around resource is a key one which we need to take forward and i think probably the best place for us to do that is in our mtfp planning because this, this is not just a one-off this, this this is looking at the whole process on a much longer term thank you councillor Hearn. thank you um i noticed in here i can't find the, the bit straight off about training now a lot of us have been here on this committee, on the planning committee, for, from the first uh, when we were first elected in 2019. We had some training then, but things do change, and people we get asked about changing the committees. Now, my th my th point is, with different things coming out from the government will the training be updated every year while the council is in progress between sort of for its four years terms and the, the people actually made shall we say to attend those otherwise they don't stay on the committee does uh, councillor tonkins do you want to answer that uh, yes uh, thank Chairman, you I'm, I'm i'm waiting for the end of all the comments and all oh, right, right. You. okay uh, I'm conscious that we've got Richard Kent with us. Richard, do you want to say anything? Chairman, no, uh, only if members wanted me to say anything, but I think Councillor Crawford Hawley has probably got uh, answers to the points that have been made, but happy to help if it would help anybody else. Excellent. Counts Sorry, I'm switching myself off. We can move to Councillor Crawford Hawley to. Uh, uh, provide a, a review of those questions. Yes, Chairman. Uh, if I could just highlight, there were three points, I think, which um, came through to me from the conversation. Um, one, the, the need for clarity, um, and I, I think that, that applies um, to not just the officers, but members sometimes um, could do with a little training in, in, in clarity at, uh, at, at planning meetings. Um, the issue of under-resourcing, um, which has got progressively worse over the years, so I'm glad that it's a, a senior member of the executive who's mentioned that because they are the purse holders and, and, and um, you can give us more staff, can't you? So between all you executive members, thank you very much. Uh, and, and the point about training update, very important because you know, I've, I've been at this game for a long, long time, not quite since the 1947 Town and Planning Act, but you know, we, we all get rusty and, and therefore uh, to have regular updated training is important. Um, not just for the way we administer things, but also I think we owe it to applicants who are spending a lot of money putting in planning applications, and they deserve to have a professional service responding to their applications. And it, it's not just the officers who are obviously professional, but we have to be as well. Um, and so uh, thank, thank colleagues for those comments, and, and they're certainly being taken on, on board. Um, I don't know if there was anything else that I missed. Um, no, nope. thank you, Chairman. No, in which case, um, no further questions, no further debate. As with the other items, I don't think there's been a move to amend anything. So I think we can uh, move to, um, well, the, uh, the recommendation. Um, so, it's been duly seconded, so all those in favour of the recommendations? I'll just ask if there are any against. One against. Abstain, Chairman. 
and one abstention. And I'll abstain. Two abstentions, so none against and two abstentions. Right. Thank you. On we go then to uh, the next item. Um, item 17. Uh, reports and matters referred from other committees, from the other committees, and there are none. And item 18, and this is turning into the Councillor Crawford Hawley show to some extent. So it's uh, Heritage and Regeneration Champion Report, which has been published with the agenda. Councillor Crawford Hawley. Chairman, um, it, it's printed, it's before you, you've read it. Um, I've got nothing else to add. Um, That's to be noted then, good. Um, and we move on to item 19, uh, which are the reports on joint arrangements and external organizations and questions relating thereto. Um, we've got uh, the Avon Fire Authority, which has been published from, uh, published with the agenda and was uh, produced by Councillor Payne. Uh, to be noted, any questions for Councillor Payne or any comments? No, and we move on to uh, Avon and Somerset Police and Crime Panel, and it's a report by myself, again published with the agenda, and I'm quite happy to take a question or two. Um, if not, it's to be noted. And we do have a question from Councillor Cronley. Not a question, to be fair. Um, so I just wanted to... Uh congratulate the Conservative Police and Crime Commissioner for sharing interest in North Somerset recently and visiting Congressbury, which I'm sure is all about crime and nothing about a by-election. So I hope he'll extend this interest to non-conservative wards in North Somerset in due course. Just, just for correction, of course, there, there, is, there is a by-election there, Councillor Cronley, it's, so there, there, there is no decision on, on which party represents it, but it's a massive coincidence, I would note, of course, for a man who was allegedly very, very busy with other things. And a video was all done sporadically. Spor and, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as I say, you've got the report from, uh, on the, uh, from the panel in front of you, so um, there you go. Well, perhaps taking up Councillor Cronley's point slightly further, the fact that now, because he is so busy visiting Kongsbury, that um, hotbed of crime, presumably, and a, a by-election as well, um, he needs to have a, a deputy because of all the work he's got. Perhaps he was to concentrate more on his full-time job and not on these other activities. He wouldn't be able to save the public purse the deputy's role. I shall be taking a keen interest in that as far as the panel is concerned, uh, Councillor Davis, and I'm sure uh, that Councillor Crew will as well. Uh, and on we move to uh, uh, the West of England Joint Scrutiny Committee, and there is no report. Uh, is it all right to... Oh, Councillor, Councillor James wants to give us Apologies, a verbal... Apologies, um, The meeting happened after the deadline, so I'll just give a short, very short update, which is that the West of England overview and scrutiny examined the governance review, the climate emergency, the bus network recovery, strategic rail investment, and the rail investment fund. When it came to the meeting, the governance review was not approved, and the climate emergency plan was mostly not approved. Um, this, in a view of many of the scrutiny members, uh, there, were, there, there were amendments put forward that the mayor in the proper meeting that the mayor could not support. We, uh, I think that last minute amendments via the combined authority leaders with little public scrutiny with, uh, that haven't had a chance to go to overview and scrutiny um, set a really worrying constitutional precedent. So when it does come to changing the constitution, just a recommendation from the scrutiny members that um, local authority member uh, that members of the west of england mind authority and joint committee cannot amend uh amend the uh, the motions uh, the reports going to their meeting ad hoc because that you know they were talking about 100,000 pounds in terms of expenditure that would have not have gone through any scrutiny so uh just reporting that back as a change going through weka Thank you, Councillor James. I'm sure we all caught that. Right, so we can now move on to 
Um, where are we? Sorry, I've just lost myself. We're on now to item 20, uh, the development program, business case and commissioning plan for development of council owned land to the south of the uplands, Nailsea, which has been published with the agenda. And uh, Jenny Ford uh, is available uh, if needed to uh, make comments and answer questions on, on this. And I'm handing over to Councillor Canniford to present this. Councillor Canniford. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, as you said, this uh, report sets out the business case for the residential development of the Uplands site. I mean, it is a positive opportunity um, for an agreed development of 52 homes, which fits well within our strategy. This ha has had council planning approval, so it has gone through the process in terms of the planning process, and it will provide high quality and sustainable homes. Um, it also meets our housing objectives, which I think is you know, really important. This administration has made that very clear. By the council owning this land, it does give us the opportunity to provide those standards and that quality that we all keep grumbling about isn't coming through our housing and uh, building processes. So we want to approve the commissioning plan so we can then find a partner and open a procurement process. I will be making an amendment to the recommendation, Chair. Um, well, I'll speak to that quickly now, because uh, I'm sure it will be taken on board. Um, what I would like to do is learn from the Parklands process, where Councillor Crawford Hawley wasn't particularly uh, involved and felt aggrieved that members hadn't had discussions about the quality of build. So I propose we set up a procurement group of uh, local members, exec member, and the chair of place, to drive the process forward and get the level of quality of development that the residents and the members of Nelsey would like and I'm sure will, will seek. This will be a landscape-led project, which I think is really exciting because I think the, some of the best housing developments uh, now are being landscape-led uh, and therefore the environment that people are living in is clearly far more important now than it was even a few years ago um, because of clearly what has been going on the last 18 months. So I would please like you to uh, approve these recommendations for the following reasons. It meets our corporate aims. Quality, importantly, quality housing can be delivered. The PNR have approved this and it's gone through the planning process. Uh, local members will be involved in the quality of development and how that development comes forward. It meets our asset strategy. It will be 30% 30 30 affordable homes, um, and it will meet our mixed housing needs of local people. Um, and importantly for some of the members, it will have electric charging points in all the homes, which is great to see because we can make those demands as it's our land. So I'd like to uh, look for a seconder. Yes, um, just, just for clarity there, Councillor Canniford, you mentioned that you wanted to um, put an amendment. So the amendment to this, or additional to the recommendation, That's Chairman, yeah. will be uh, a procurement group who will be taken through with officers to the procurement process to see how and how we want to forward that, um, which will include the Nailsy local members, the executive member, and the chair of place scrutiny panel. And that's together with the recommendations that we've That will be added got. to the recommendation. Yeah. Okay. And we're looking, therefore, for a seconder for that package. And we've got Councillor Davis who's putting his hand up first, I think. So Councillor Davis is seconding. Um, we can now move to uh, some debate. Are there questions from members? The solicitor has got something to say again from an absent councillor who wishes to contribute. So, Councillor Gregor, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just feel that the uh, A letter is missing from these notes. I've read them all. Um, and by A letter, I mean allotments. Because I think this council really has got to get serious about young children learning how to grow and cook food. Now, there may be an allotment site in Nelsie, but it may well be that all the plots have been taken. 
In Winford, we've got 35 allotments. They're all full and taken. And when you talk about shared gardens for new houses, the size of the, the lawns that are allotted to each house are handkerchief-sized grass areas. Really rather useless. It means the caterpillars from my sprouts would instantly ruin the dahlias next door. Uh, I, think we, I think really we should look and see if we can somehow fit in an allotment site for, say, 10 allotments to do with those 52 houses. And if that means dropping one of them, well, that's a very healthy sign. That's a very interesting point, Councillor Gregor, and close to my heart. Um, Councillor Gibbons. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask or, or get some reassurance. I mean, I welcome the fact that um, the houses are built to passive house certified standards. That's, that's fantastic. Um, and I know I go on about this in a lot of meetings, but can you reassure me that the design of this development is going to be child slash family friendly? There are a list of uh, considerations that were published in a paper by the Town and Country Planning Association about child friendly development and the fact that children are not mentioned enough, if at all, in planning documents. So I would just like to, um, I suppose, get your reassurance that this consideration has been fully taken on board. Thank you, Councillor Gibbons. Um, I'm not yet sure if it has. However, you have now brought it to the attention and I'll make sure it is. Right, Councillor uh, Cartman, I believe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Canaford. You stole what I was going to say by proposing your amendment about the procurement thing. So I think the learnings I've had from being involved with Parklands is that group, uh, and I've been on it at times with Councillor Solomon and Councillor Porter um, and uh, Councillor Crockford Hawley as well, is that it's worked really well and the early engagement is key. The thing I want to focus on, though, that I think remains is that when we, what I have learned through um, Parklands is the earlier we get involved, the more influence we have. And I think as we face the climate emergency, the, the carbon involved with building properties is almost as important as what it expends going forward. I know that these are passive house properties. Uh, I have to admit my knowledge is not enough to know whether that incorporates any aspect of their build. And I'd be quite keen that the procurement group, when they're formed, actually look at ways of minimising the carbon impact of the build process itself, having got family members involved in the construction industry, I can tell you it's pretty atrocious at the moment. Um, and I think that would be a really easy way for us to save a few tons of carbon. Thank you. Councillor James, I believe. Thank you very much. This is um, something that Councillor Richardson was quite keen for me to put f uh, through, and I'm very happy to. In respect of the Uplands Commission plan, the ref report refers to the appropriation process for land as having been completed by today's meeting. It is important that matters like this, where various parts of the council interacting in our capacity as landowner, planning authority and so on, for this to be as open and transparent as possible. Could Councillor Canaford or whoever the relevant uh, portfolio holder is confirm that the, that the appropriation process was undertake, undertaken in accordance with the law and due process and has been completed? Can he also confirm it was appropriately advertised to residents and interested parties and subject to consultation? And also, how many responses were received to that consultation? Thank you, Councillor James. I will have to ask the executive member responsible, which would be Councillor Bridger, on that one. Chairman, I think that might be more appropriate for me to take. Certainly, Councillor James, I can confirm it was all carried out properly in accordance with the law, as you would expect. That's part of my duty as monitoring officer, and it wouldn't have happened otherwise. Uh, so, yes, it has all been carried out. Due process has been carried out throughout the process. And there was a, a lengthy uh, document setting out the, the criteria that had to be taken into account for the executive member to consider. 
um, and I have to say that I'm impressed with the amount of time and effort he put into that consideration and, and taking that forward. And in terms of the number of um, responses, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but they were all set out in the reports, um, which were on the, all on the website and are still now on the website for the call-in period, and that's stated at each stage how many consultation responses we had had. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I uh, can hand back to the solicitor then, who's going to tell us what Councillor Ashton wishes to say. Thank you, Chairman. So comments from Councillor Ashton on this one. Nelsey Development. Looking through all the attached schedules, I could not find a plan other than the site access plan, which seems to be just indicative of how the construction would take place. It does not show how it links to anywhere else, and having been told by an officer that there are no plans for any new roads, this means all the construction traffic and then the new residents and commercial traffic would have to mostly go through Tickenham or Backwell. Have you any idea how impossible that would be? Those routes are bad enough on a normal day, but if anything happens on the M5, which is every summer, those roads are gridlocked. With inevitable further expansion in the future, we must look for a proper solution, such as taking traffic from the M5 to the South Bristol area, which has been talked about and planned for many years. How can this council claim to be environmentally aware and at the same time put more traffic through our villages and on unsuitable roads? We need to be planning ahead, not taking the short-term cheapest options. By the time this development actually happens, we could have tied in contributions from government, North Somerset, Bristol, a number of developers and local businesses that would all benefit. By the time this development actually happens, we will be saying we need a bigger road. Would Councillor Solomon, in his role of Executive Member for Highways, come with me to see some of the difficult pinch points we have in the area? That's his chair, uh, comments, Chairman. If I may add um, myself, so uh, in, in the report, uh, it refers at paragraph 1.4 to the appropriation process, and also saying... I do apologise. Um, so that, that was the comments from, from Councillor Ashton. Um, and then in the report, if I can just deal with item 1.4, um, that deals with the appropriation process and indicated that it, it was hoped that that would be considered by today. I can confirm it has been considered and the decision has been made and posted on the website. Um, that is now subject to call-in for five days. Obviously, if there is a call-in and if that call-in were to um, result in any change in the executive member decision, this, this, this item might need to come back to you. Um, obviously, that doesn't preclude you dealing with it today, but just be aware that that appropriation process is still running alongside and there is a call-in process that hasn't yet completed. Thank you, Solicitor. Uh, Councillor Canifer, do you want to come back on anything that's been said? Not particularly, but it's, I, I think it's a great opportunity. Of course, Every site has its difficulties, but this is an opportunity for us to produce some of the stuff we really want to see. So I hope members support. Thank you. In which case, I suspect we can move to a vote on this. Um, I, don't, I didn't catch that there was enough um, dubiety to bring forward any amendments. Chairman, so, no, no, no amendment, but there is the additional... Um, apart from, from Councillor Canniford, which I, I'm suggesting is an addition at the end, which merely says, with the additional requirement that a procurement group comprised of local members, chair of scrutiny panel, and executive member be involved in the development partner selection process. Uh, that's very clear, thank you. And are you happy with that, uh, Councillor Canniford and Councillor Davis? Right, we will move to a vote on that basis then. So, all those in favour? Are there any against? Two against, and are there any abstentions? Yes, Chairman, as um, a result of my historic opposition and prejudgment of this application, I'll abstain from voting. Thank you, Councillor Tonkin. That's a clear result, though, so we can carry it and we can move on. Yes, so, uh, 21, submission of bid to the levelling up fund. Um, again, Jenny Ford is with us for this. And again, it's Councillor Canniford to present. Uh, Councillor Canniford, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and again, I'll try and be brief on this. Uh, 
this is a re retrospective approval. The bid had to be in by the uh, 18th of June, uh, a bid for £15 million, uh, and I'm sure all members are aware of what those, th th those items on that bid are. Um, it is focused on Western, and for those who uh, wonder why that is the case, it's because Western fits the bid. Um, uh, north of our district simply doesn't fit in and would not be taking into account if we put a bid in uh, to the government. Um, we also have the placemaking strategy which has been approved by this council and we have partners fully engaged uh, and working with us on opportunities in and around the town. We did ask for ideas from members, these were considered and on the list um, when before it was shortlisted down. Um, and the, the ideas and the identification of ideas have come through the Super Western Placemaking Strategy, of which we had 5,000 responses. Um, and at the, the top of this uh, application clearly is the Tropicana, which I think people are now aware of, um, and to create a much more flexible and usable space for a very well needed uh, 8,000 people uh, arena, which is very much needed in the West Country, definitely. Um, and also to, uh, to help do the other things in Western and give us the opportunity to do the other things which have been decades problems uh, for this area, uh, including Burnbeck Sovereign Centre, um, and measures to improve the public realm and join up some of the work that has been done by other administrations in the past. It is a case of just trying to connect those together to create a good uh, wayfinding message so when you come into the town, you get some sort of continual message of direction. There is a very clear strategy agreed for Western now, um, and businesses and residents seem to be getting well behind that. Businesses most certainly are behind the, the, the placemaking strategy and are contributing to that regularly. And this will obviously add to the other projects like the Marine Lake, the Coastal Path, and the work we're already focusing on the, the Sovereign Centre. It will create 120 jobs, including apprentices, um, and the money will need to be spent by March 24. So we will have to get on with it and will there be no dilly-dallying if we are successful with the bid, which we will find out in autumn. So the following recommendations, uh, please support them. Uh, the, the problems and the, de the deal will deal with decades old problems. Um, the council simply do not have the funds to do it themselves. It is supported by our residents and our businesses. Uh, members have been engaged. Both MPs fully support this grant and this application and have spoken in Parliament. Uh, and all these projects will help the disadvantaged uh, through giving apprenticeships and giving jobs. We can all be part of this success and I hope that we support it today. Thank you, Councillor Canniford. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Cartman, I think, had his hand up first. Right, are there any questions? Is there any wish for a debate? Um, well, we, we will get a debate. Councillor Cronley. Just a, just a quick question, just so I can be clear in my head. The, obviously, the priority two and the priority one comparisons. You know, North Somerset is God is a category two, sorry, not priority two. What does that mean in practice? Does that mean if we submit a bid, uh, the priority one, uh, category ones will almost get the first go, and then category twos will get the second, or is it just two separate pots of funding for different categories? No, there, there were three categories, um, and, and, and North Somerset fell into, into the middle, not because of its overall demographics. The north of the district was very clearly uh, a category three, and Western Supermare was very clearly a category one. Um, so they averaged us out as category two. So our bid effectively has been very focused on Western and our MPs have very much supported that and represented us on that uh, mm. because Western Supermare is obviously suffering from the success and the wealth of north of the district. Um, so effectively, uh, we are trying to separate the two areas, the two constituency areas. So Western Supermare is clearly in the level that would be funded. The disadvantage, of course, we've had and officers have had and they've worked extremely hard and I think we need to thank them to, for the amount of work they've done on this because they've managed to uh, do this whole grant process with no funding at all where all other uh, category one authorities were given a hundred, just over £100,000 I believe to put their grant together. So our officers have managed to do that within their own 
abilities and funding, and, and I think that's uh, very admirable, and I thank them for that. So that's why we find ourselves in the middle, sadly, because of the wealth of the north and the poverty of the south. Any further comments? No? Before we move to the vote, I must say that I, I do get a bit... Um, dubious on occasion about these hypothecated funding operations that we uh, get as a replacement in many ways for what Councillor Crockford Hawley was going on about regarding planning local democracy. It would be pleasant to have money in our trust to be able to spend. But no, we don't. Anyway, on we go. So I think with the absence of anybody else wishing to speak, we can move to a vote. So, all those in favour? That's clearly carried. Are there any against? No. Any abstentions? No. Councillor Hearn was out of the room. Fine. Okay, good. On we go then to... Uh, Item 22, the adoption of the North Somerset Active Travel Strategy, which has been published with the agenda. This time we've got Alex Hearn, who's available should he be required. And it's Councillor Davis to present. So over to you, Councillor Davis. Thank you. And thank you to officers for the, for the amount of work they've put into this document. As you see from the papers, there's a hell of a lot in here, and there's, that, that doesn't cover all the discussions they've had with members and indeed members of the public, and the fact that the the consultation um, was pretty wide and wide-ranging. So it's a very simple recommendation. Yeah, I think it's quite a significant message we're sending. We as a council, indeed under the previous administration, declared a climate emergency. And for both um, us as a council and an area and the UK government more generally, active travel is a key priority to enable the switch to clean energy as soon as possible. And given the climate catastrophe we, we face, and I think that was brought home very starkly in the last couple of weeks, not least the, the, the loss of life in Western Europe over the last couple of days, but indeed the significant amount of loss of life and property in, in, in the West of, of, of the Americas, in Canada and in, in the USA. And I think a lot of that tragedy in both locations still continues. Um, and of course, it's very simple to engage with this. You know, you, you can walk or indeed cycle. And I would take my hat off to very many of my colleagues, particularly in Western Supermare, who are now cycling a great deal to and from meetings and indeed around, around the town. So demonstrating that you know, it's easy for us to put, put this into practice. Um, but I do think that beyond that, we do need to, to offer a strategic vision, and this, this document does just that. Um, it also addresses some other pretty significant issues. The health crisis, I think a, a more active population is certainly healthier uh, physically and indeed mentally. Um, it supports local jobs and businesses. If you, are, if you think local and travel locally, you tend to go to local shops and businesses to, to, to do things economically. And rather than getting on the M5 to go north to Cribs, you think about spending your money within both North Somerset and, and the towns and, and towns and villages. So that gives a social benefit and a, and, and a beneficial cycle of development. And certainly a less car-focused life gives us more opportunity to better use the space we have I think that's pretty important when, when we look at the challenges of you know, the, the climate emergency and, and the planning as, as, as came forward in an, in an earlier piece around the amount of space we do use up to park cars currently. If we could use less of that for parking, more of it for development, we certainly would potentially make more pleasant communities. And I also think the fairness, if we ally this with the, the, the better public transport plan that we're working very hard upon, Active travel combined with public transport gives real choice at last for everybody to, to, to travel around and take, take those opportunities that are open to them. So I'll just reiterate the, the four goals which are very clearly laid out within the paper of um, safe and frequent active travel to improve public health, tackle the climate emergency, drive local economic growth, and shake, shape active travel neighbourhoods. Uh, I know you'll, you'll have read the papers in detail, but page 77 of the strategy of the document gives you a great summary of this vision to pass on to, on to residents who are asking what this, um, what this really means for them and indeed for us. And I look forward to your support for this motion. So I look for a seconder. Uh, Councillor Petty is going to do this, but I think Stuart McQuillan offered to do so. 
Uh, Councillor McQuillan is, uh, is second in, I believe. Um, Thank you, Stuart. So, uh, we need to have some debate. So, let's see who we've got. Councillor Bell. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and, and I'm happy to, well, not happy, happy is the wrong word, I'm going to stop saying I'm happy, willing, I'm willing to uh, support this uh, active travel strategy, but I, I just want to um, put some context ar around it, because the concept of um, promoting and enabling uh, walking and cycling and other active modes of, of travel, I am 100% uh, behind, so I've got no qualms about that at all. But what I did just want to put on record is that I find the entire way that the government, and it sort of alludes to the planning motion earlier and the chairman's remarks after the last item as well, I really find the way the government insists on uh, delivering funding to local communities uh, in this way really unsatisfactory uh, because ultimately we have seen it over the last, so let's remember that the active travel funding that was made available uh, to local authorities was defined as emergency active travel funding uh, initially and it was called emergency funding, not because we've got a climate emergency or an urgent need uh, to invest in walking and cycling, but because there was an urgent need to give people a safer and better way of getting around during the COVID restrictions. So that was what was motivating the government. It wasn't some bigger, loftier ambition. Uh, it was just the pressures uh, of, of COVID. Uh, and unfortunately, inevitably, when the government uh, says, oh, by the way, guys, we've suddenly found some money that we'd like to give you for active travel schemes, local authorities around the country then rush to develop schemes uh, in order to bid for that funding uh, and get some of it. Uh, nothing wrong with that. That's a perfectly reasonable reaction. But of course, the problem with that is that it leads you to make decisions to chase the money uh, rather than uh, to make decisions based on what the community actually wants and needs. And that's my frustration um, with the way that not just North Somerset, but all local authorities um, have approached active travel far too often. And that is we have chased the money uh, rather than looked uh, at a proper comprehensive strategy. And even with this document, document that is called an active travel strategy, there's still a touch of um, uh, 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 making the strategy fit the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So it's still a strategy that is designed to unlock government funding rather than necessarily uh, to meet the needs uh, of the local community. So that's why uh, I just wanted to put that on record. And I do think as a council, there will come a time when we need to be prepared to say, we're not going to chase the money and we are going to start with a blank piece of paper and ask the community uh, to evidence and tell us what they want and then we will try and deliver it. Um, and if we don't do that, we are just going to get stuck in this loop uh, where we produce strategies to justify government diktat and government carries on issuing the diktat because local authorities keep jumping through the hoops uh, to obtain the funding. And I'm afraid, that the, I'm not confident that the end result of all of that is always the best possible schemes and the best possible solutions uh, for local communities. So I will support this strategy, um, but with that caveat that there comes a point when we will need to revisit our approach on this as an authority and make sure that in active travel, as in lots of other areas, we genuinely are led by our priorities and not those handed down to us by government. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Crockford Hawley. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. I, I, like, like Mike, I don't object to this. It, it's a perfectly good report. I, I just wonder why we need 105 pages to tell us what is blatantly obvious to everyone. Um, when the pandemic started, this council was offering the use of e-bikes for a short time. Um, and I borrowed one, um, kept it for a month, handed it back. I was so impressed with it, I went straight out and bought one. I'm on it every day since then. I'm sorry, it wasn't necessary to have a strategy um, or, or to have something that looks delightful because because it's been printed um, professionally, it just made sense. And so often, I think, we, we get ourselves so embroiled with reports for no other reason than we can produce them, rather than we need to produce them. Um, and yeah, go ahead with it, but I didn't need it to tell me to get on my bike. Indeed. Councillor McQuillan and then Councillor Bridger. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, very happy to, to second this motion. Uh, just make a couple of brief points. Um, 
travel in North Somerset represents 42% 40 sorry, of our carbon emissions, and I really welcome the focus on transport in general. And as Dr. Davis has said, this has to be seen in the context of other efforts to reduce carbon intensive transport around public transport. Um, and to, I do sympathise with the points made by Councillor Bell. I think sometimes the, the chasing of government funding can make life very, very difficult. And I, I wonder whether that's something we should take up with our local MPs. Having said that, the results of this consultation do say there is a lot of general support for, for active, uh, active, active travel. Indeed, there's a lot of results here that suggest that people want to go further and faster. So I think the direction of travel is clear, but I agree maybe the individual schemes, there needs to be careful engagement. Thank you. Councillor Bridget. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to endorse this report wholeheartedly. I think it's, frankly, one of the most important pieces of work that we're doing as a council at the moment. I think it needs to be, it obviously speaks to different audiences. I think it needs to be partly written the way it's written because it helps to frame bids. I mean, that's just the, the nature of things at the moment. Unfortunately, capital funding levels within the public sector are largely driven by national priorities and um, timescales. And I, I, I take the point that, that colleagues have made, but that, that's a fact. Of course, you know, we need to ensure that the schemes that come forward do have broad support uh, within, com uh, within communities. I say broad support, not unanimous support, because that's never the, never the case. And we need to show leadership. And some of these schemes, frankly, are you know, will we'll cause, cause challenges for, for ourselves, actually, as local, local members. But I think the strategy is the right sort of policy response uh, at the moment. It makes it clear, I think, um, that it you know, makes clear what we want to do and, and the kind of larger vision that it supports. Frankly, a, a lot of the schemes that are mentioned in the uh, strategy have been in sort of gestation for for years, you know, some of them decades. So I think the priorities of communities is there in the report to be, uh, to be, to be seen. Obviously, we, we, we do need to be mindful that, that they have support and we, we absolutely undertake all the consultation and engagement that we, that we, that we should, be, should be taking and, and we don't always get that right. But um, I think it's an excellent report and I commend all the officers who have been working on it and um, wholeheartedly support it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bridget. Councillor James. Thank you very much, Chair. The Climate Action Plan update this year made it very clear that whilst the Council has made progress on the climate emergency, there's been a negative modal shift, uh, an increase in car use. Um, that's pre-pandemic. Um, it's even more so now. Um, to respond to this, this Council really needs to make it easier for people to make active travel choices, making safe and inclusive opportunities to walk, cycle, scoot, ride a horse, whatever it is, um, is a way to gear change here in North Somerset. This strategy is about allowing those choices, allowing children to walk to school safely while fears of being knocked down or mowed down by a car, letting us get a bike to Clevedon or Bristol and not pay that £6.50 bus fare, which is blooming expensive. Um, so this is really about uh, allowing us to make safe choices. Um, I am a bit disappointed sometimes that individual councillors, especially in my area in Portishead, can be up in arms of the motorist lobby. Um, they really aren't acting on a climate emergency um, when they are denying uh, the ability to put in cycle paths here, here in, Port, uh, in Portishead, for instance. I read in Somerset Life that very few of the stakeholders in Portishead, uh, the political stakeholders that is, allowed any cycle paths in Portishead. As a child, I wrote to my councillor the first ever engagement because I felt unsafe going down St Mary's Road because we're constantly going into the bushes to avoid cars. I wanted that road closed. As a councillor, I brought that up, but there wasn't the ambition to prioritise children and pedestrians and cyclists over the motorist lobby. We really need to, a cultural change within ourselves as councillors if we're going to respond to the climate emergency. I do agree, agree the strategy approach isn't amazing. Um, we, you know, we have a government that's a bit obsessed, but whilst we have gear change, the government's report about cycling, whilst we have LC WIP, which is the 
way that the government have said that they wanted to do this within urban areas. Um, it's something we're going to do, and it's great to have this strategy, which the government have said is a very strong one, and we can see that from the fact that they've given us the most of uh, other local authorities in uh, grants. Our local authority is the only local authority, one of the only local authorities to be given well beyond what it asked for in cycling grants, and that's because the ambition that we presented, and we need to then show that it was worth the government uh, giving us that money by implementing all of those projects and giving them our support. Um, I wish that we went a bit further. I wish, you know, we had the strawberry line extended to Clevedon, that we had the Gordano Gateway. I wish it were possible for me to cycle from Portishead to Weston for these meetings, but it, it's pretty darn hard. But if we have the, this strategy implemented, it will be much easier for members, members of the public, to make those choices which currently aren't available to us. Then we can respond to the climate emergency. Until then, uh, you know, it's business as usual. Um, I'm really happy that Deliveroo have opened recently in, in many of our towns here this week. Um, a, cyc uh, a cycling mainly delivery company popping around and it's great to have more active travel uh, choices made by businesses. So that's just a b bit from me, but um, yeah, I'm very in favour of this report, although I do wish it went further, but that's really due to the lack of member ambition. Thank you, Councillor James. Uh, any further comments? Councillor Gibbons. Just a quick one. Um, it comes out of a conversation I had with a resident recently about this. And um, I'll just relay his concern that he felt, as a disabled person who likes to get out and about as much as possible in various ways, that he's worried there isn't enough consideration for those who have mobility issues and uh, what we're going to do about it, basically, in terms of active travel. How much consideration are we given to the disabled? Yes, there are a lot of um, areas that we need to uh, keep working on, but I think it's a, it's a case of um, always striving for the best, but making sure that you put the good into place when you can. Um, so we can move to a vote, I suspect. Oh, somebody wants to speak? Ah, yeah, Councillor Hearn. Sorry, I didn't see you. Sorry. Yeah, but, yeah. You gave, gave part of my thing away because North Somerset, we have an elderly population. A lot of them, unfortunately, as they get older, get iller, and we've got problems with that. But that don't, we can't just stop them being able to get out and about. Now, when something came up similar to this a little while ago, I think the roads or whatever we're going to use to do this, we have to allow for vehicles as well as cyclists and pedestrians and what have you to come around because this area is mainly full of B roads and unnumbered roads. So if we're going to use anything, we've really got to think carefully as to what and where we are going to put any cycling stuff. Thank you, Councillor Hearn. I think Councillor Davis wants to say something. Well, just, just to come on the point on, on disabled access, I think we do an awful lot of work in terms of the cycle paths. I'm, and I have a, a correspondent in Pill who regularly goes from Pill to Portishead and into Bristol on, on the cycle paths on one of those little battery-powered scooters. I think he's 94, and he always reports very quickly to me. And I think the frustration for him is when we get parking of vehicles on the pavement so preventing people from getting getting past um, I do understand the point that Sandra Hearn's making but I do think we we, we need to balance that with, with with the other impacts we we have to be a society in which the ability to drive anywhere in a car has to be balanced with the ability of others to enjoy that environment as well and I would say that you, the the number of disabled people that complain to me that their inability to access because of in, inadequate ability to, to move their you know, wheelchairs or any sort of access around is, is pretty pretty major and people parking in disabled parking spaces because there isn't another space available and that type of thing I just think is is all part of a bigger picture but I think we've, we've debated this thank you very much colleagues for your support I do know the comments 
um, from Mike Bell and others around the, the, the environment we live in, in terms of funding. And I think that's the reason behind this, the politics of this report. I think I would ask you to support it now and thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. All right, I think we can now move to the vote. So, uh, all those in favour of the adoption? Yep. Yeah. And just for clarity, are there any against? No. Nope. And any abstentions? No. Nope. Good. So that's carried. Right, item 23, Metro West Phase 1 delivery update. Now, I've got to uh, remind members that should they wish to discuss uh, the item in the exempt appendix, we will need to move into confidential session. If, they, if members are happy that they can discuss this item, or well, this item can be discussed without referring to the uh, exempt item, then we don't need to move into confidential session. So, does anybody wish to bring up the item in the exempt appendix? That's a firm no, so in which case I can hand over to Councillor Bridger. Councillor Bridger. Thank you, Chairman. Last but not least, and not least because this is obviously you know, it's a mass massive uh, project in terms of um, the finance involved, £116 million. Pounds. So uh, just a few brief words to, to present the report. So this is a general update really on the progress of, of, of the project, the Metro West project, um, in particular phase 1B, which is obviously of most interest um, to us, I think, and our residents, which is the reopening of the Portishead Rail Link and, and new stations at, at Portishead and, and Pill. There are, though, some, uh, you'll see some, from the recommendations, some authorizations we're seeking from, from council uh, today to, uh, to move ahead with the next, next stage of this priority project. So specifically, we're asking council to approve um, delegated authorization to enter into an implement implementation agreement with uh, Network Rail that's jointly with WECA. This is a scheme, as you know, that we're co-promoters of with WECA. Uh, there's two parts to that um, to be met from already uh, the secured funding, which I mentioned was £116 million. Pounds. The first, first part is around the detailed design of the project. So that's the reference to that is in the um, confidential appendix that, that the chairman mentioned. Um, that's commercially sensitive, so obviously that's that's why that's confidential. In order, in order to progress the, uh, the detailed design stage um, for those works, we need to, as I say, um, and that's GRIP 5 in network rail language, but let's, let's call it detailed design. Um, as I say, we need to um, jointly with WECA enter in this implementation agreement with network rail. That's before network rail can actually uh, issue the... Um, tender to, to the market, which they want to do uh, imminently. We're also asking uh, Council to, to note, I think, that following completion of the detailed design and uh, approval of the full business case um, to early next year, a separate report will come again to, to this Council um, around, around next summer uh, to authorise the, the, the second part of the imp implementation agreement, and that will be a really big decision for the council because that, that's effectively we'll be entering, we'll be awarding the construction contracts um, for the actual, you know, um, to implement the project and reopen the, 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 the branch line itself. The report also asked council to authorize the uh, procure, procurement plan. So that's appendix one in the report before you. Uh, that's that's quite technical, but it obviously uh, there's the description within that report of within that appendix of the the, the elements to to, to, the, to the works proposed, timescales for uh, procurement, and the estimated values of the of the individual contracts. Uh, the procurement actually for this phase of the works is is being led by um, by North Somerset Council, so I think it's probably a good time to 
to thank um, all the project team involved in, in, in this, particularly uh, James uh, Wilcock, but, but everyone from, from, uh, from Joe Down really has been involved in this project. So thank you very much uh, to officers. Thank you too for um, scrutiny to the place panel for their continued engagement with the development of this, of this project uh, and, and some of the detail. Finally, um, almost finally actually, um, I should say there's, there's also a, um, a note about continuing the process for acquiring land to deliver the project um, in advance of the decision we should get from the Secretary of State um, around the development consent order. I think that's due from around the middle of October, October, November time. I also want to draw ten, uh, members' attention to recommendation six, which uh, is to authorize the disposal of some historic uh, railway assets within the Portishead area um, to uh, the Avon Valley Railway for reuse for their, their, their heritage railway line extension into, into Bath. That's section eight within the report. Um, I think that's a really good, uh, really good news, a nice bit of, a uh, nice story. I know we'll, uh, some members will be particularly, particularly interested in, in, in that. So to sum up, uh, Chair, I think if reassurance were, were needed, I'd like to sort of inform colleagues that we're, we're fit for delivery of, um, of the Metro, Metro West project. We're currently proceeding within the approved uh, budget. Uh, that was as agreed within the uh, the outline business case back in December 2017 under the previous administration. There are risks, of course, you wouldn't expect there not to be risks um, in a project of this sort of magnitude. Um, but, you know, we're, this is a, an absolute priority, I think, for, to, for the council to, to deliver in line with our both our corporate plan and... Um, what we've just been talking about, actually, the wider, you know, wider package of, of public transport advancements and uh, active travel and, and, and so on. So um, I think, I, Chair, I'd like to just ask Council to approve the recommendations in the report. Thank you. And we need a seconder, please. Councillor Davis is seconding it. Are there any questions? Councillor Cartman. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Councillor Bridget. I, th I think for me, the Portishead Railway is uh, a bit of nightmares and dreams, really. I think the dream of a railway is, is good in terms of um, getting people off the roads and, and, and the active travel and the right. And, and the, the nightmare is the cost element of it. And I think we're moving into a really crucial phase now. And I know we've got a, a lot of contingency built into the budget. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that we'll enter into a, a side agreement with Weka to jointly share the risk on that. I suppose my question for him is, does he feel that the level of member in involvement and scrutiny is high enough to make sure that we have sight of any escalating costs in advance of the full business plan? I think my question kind of has the agenda behind that I'm not sure it does yet. So I suppose my question should be, would he work with me to ensure that we make sure there's enough uh, member involvement and scrutiny over this over the coming year uh, particularly I'm not sure which scrutiny panel this project actually aligns with now as well um, and I'm keen that we keep on top of the costs and make sure um, that the public interest is represented thank you can I respond to that briefly chair sorry uh, Councillor Bridger can I respond to that briefly you you can yep. indeed. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Ash, for that question. Uh, short answer is yes. Obviously, there's, there, there is scrutiny of the detail of the project uh, from, the, from the place panel. We obviously discuss it um, with the officer team at a high level within the capital delivery strategic group. I think you're, you're, you're right, though. Um, I think we could probably have a conversation with perhaps Councillor Richardson in terms of the open. Now we've got this kind of over, overview. Uh, scrutiny panel as well, perhaps to look at some of the, the, the financial the financial side a, a, a bit more. I'd be open to that. So it's something we can talk about. Councillor Davis. Thank you. Thanks for all the work that's gone into this. I mean, this, this is just a massively big project, and I do share Ash Cartman's um, comments as well. Um, for me, at a very minor level, we will be able to witness the um, the line moving forward at the Avon Valley Railway. So I'm really pleased that we're able to use those those assets elsewhere. Just for information for members and indeed members of the public watching, I've seen an, an email this morning from 
um, James Wilcock to say that the planning spectra have published the following update on their DCO website. The examining authority issued a recommendation report to the Secretary of State on the 19th of July. The Secretary of State had three months in which to issue a decision. The decision letter and recommendation report will be published on this project page once a decision has been made. We don't get to see that recommendation report. Um, it's for the Secretary of State only. And we should see a decision sometime either on or after the 19th of October. So things are moving forward, albeit slowly. Excellent. Right. So we need to have a vote on this. So all those in favour of what we have in front of us. I think that is unanimous. Think. Yep. So we don't need to check on anybody else. Good. Uh, well, we move to item 24. Um, urgent business permitted, etc. And there is none, as far as I'm aware. So I am very happy and pleased to declare this first meeting, face-to-face -face meeting for 16 months, uh, to be at an end. And I'd just like to thank all members who've turned up and all officers who've come along. Um, and just to say that uh, it is very pleasant to be back here, as it were. Thank you. Goodbye.